Ah, Rafael, you cannot record? No. Uh -huh. Okay, so now we are live on Zoom. Uh, we are live on YouTube. So this is, is uh, the Azat Miftak of the day. We will start at 4 p.m. Okay. So, um, um, let's see. Ilya, can you Ilya, can you record? Uh, yes, yes, I am yes. able to record. Yes. So, Rafael, you should be able to record. Okay. So let's see. Now, could you record? Good. Okay, so we, we will start in seven minutes, the Azat Miftak of day. Hello, Marina. Hello, Marina, do you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Perfect. OK, good. Now I'm waiting for, uh, so we have the first speaker, but we need the opening speech. So I hope that Cedric will be here soon.
So we will start the Azat Miftakov day in four minutes. Okay, good. Cedric is here. Hello, Cedric, do you hear me? Cedric, I think you can speak now. Could you speak? Cédric, do you hear me? Je m'installe. Très bien. OK. Yes, I hear you now. Voilà. I see Peter also here. Nice. So we have almost all. Hello. Hello. I'm still waiting for uh, uh, Sasha from soon. Hello. Okay, so Cédric, are you ready? So I think it's time. I hope that Cedric is uh, here. We will start in just one or two minutes. That's the time to connect with Cedric.
Cedric, are you here? I am, I am here. Ah, very good. Okay, could you put your uh, camera so we can start? Yeah, very we... good, nice to see you. <laughs> okay, so Cedric is here and it's time to start. Okay, so uh, hello and welcome to the Azat Miftak of Day. My name is Ahmed Abbas and I am a mathematician and uh, at CNRS and the HOS in Paris and a member of the Azat Miftakov Committee that organizes this webinar. We are meeting today to show solidarity with Azat Miftakov, a graduate student from Moscow State University, who has been arbitrarily detained by Russian state authorities for almost two years and a half, and who was sentenced to six years in penal, in penal colony last February. This event is sponsored by the SMF, the French Mathematical Society, that I warmly thank. In a moment, Cédric Villani, member of the French National Assembly, will deliver the opening speech. Then we will have three mathematical lectures of 15 minutes each by Marina Vyazovska, Alexander Bufitov, and Peter Scholz. Between the first and the second lecture, we will be showing a 15, minutes, uh, a 15 minute video about Azat's case. This uh, will cause a slight delay in the program, so we will not take questions, but you can put your questions in the, in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube channel comments, and we will pass them on to the speakers. My colleague, Ilya Kapovich, will give the closing remarks on behalf of the Azat Mishtakov Committee. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Cédric Villani, mathematician, member of the French Academy of Sciences, and member of the French Na National Assembly, who will deliver the opening speech. Okay, Cédric, you, you have the microphone. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Dear friends and colleagues, it is an honor, although a sad honor, for me to introduce this day of lectures dedicated to our Russian colleague, Azat Miftakov. I thank the Azat Miftakov Committee for their trust in inviting me to introduce this day. Just a few days ago, I was among the group of mathematicians and officials who welcomed our Turkish colleague, Tuna Altinel. For two years, he had to endure persecution by the Turkish institutions, forbidding him to come back to his university in Lyon a whole international community was mobilized in France and in Turkey for his case. From the university to the city of Villeurbanne to the parliament to raise voice and accompany Tuna throughout each step of the Kafka style maze that he had to endure. This was not the first time that I was involved in a teamwork to help the light shine again in the darkness. For years, I have been one of those calling for memory work in favor of the mathematician Maurice Audin, arbitrarily captured, tortured, and killed in the Algeria war. It took more than 60 years between the moment when Audin was arrested, 11th June 1957, and the historical declaration of President Macron on 13 September 2018. Some of our mathematician colleagues, such as Laurent Schwartz, Michel Brouet, Gérard Tronel, and many others, have been quite active, starting with the public PhD defense of Odin, organized by Laurent Schwartz in the absence of Odin himself, to this day, where not only the Odin case has been put in the daylight, but also some of the practice of torture at the time, which was such a disgrace. Today, we are gathered for another one of these cases in which a fellow human being is prosecuted by an administration. It may look like an endless pit to go through all these individual cases. After all, it is estimated that there are more than 100,000 prisoners of opinion around the world. So why focus and use so much energy on individual cases? First, because each of them as a fellow human, deserves our wholehearted support. As they say, he who saves a single life 
saves the world entire. But also some individual cases become emblematic of a larger cause and have repercussions for many other cases. And in the case today, this is one of our colleagues, member of our community, with whom we have shared work and mathematical dreams. And so today, this is the fate of Azat Miftakov, 20 year, year old, originally from Tatarstan, pursuing studies of mathematics at Moscow State University, and now persecuted for more than two years. First arrested for explosive manufacturing with no proof, case dismissed. Then re-arrested for breaking a window one year ago at an office of the United Russia Party under the testimony of two secret witnesses, one of whom was already dead during the trial. Does it not sound like a joke? No joke. Miftakov was beaten by the police. Miftakov was sentenced to six years of prison. It is heartbreaking to see Russia with its glorious scientific tradition, still fighting with the demons of political persecution, which broke the careers and lives of so many people already. It is my conviction that mathematicians and scientists always have to stand up against absurdity and unfairness and re-expose their faith in the power of daring thought, free speech, and the combination of logics and imagination, which is so important for us. In this very special day, we shall not only hear words from our very respected colleagues, Anatoly Vershik and Tuna Altinel, but also hear great mathematics by world-renowned experts. Marina Vyazovska from the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, Alexander Bufetov from CNRS, Institut de Mathématiques de Marseille, and Steckloff Institute. And last but not least, our young colleague from Bonn, Peter Scholz, who, as you know, received the Fields Medal in Rio three years ago. It is a pleasure to thank the French Mathematical Society for their support of this outstanding event. Thank you. Thank you, Cédric. Thank you for your commitment to the defense of human rights and your strong words in support of Azat. Okay, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce the second speaker, Marina Vyazowska from Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, who will speak on sphere packings, universal optimality, and, and Fourier interpolation. Marina, you have the microphone. Oh, thank you. So it's my pleasure to give the first scientific talk of today. So I will share my slides. Okay, so. so I hope you can see yes, my first, perfect. first slide. Yes, very good. Yes, so today I will speak about uh, sphere packing, uh, universal optimality, and Fourier interpolation. And so the picture you can see here on my first slide, this is a lake filled with shadow balls, so-called shadow balls. And what we can see, even though the balls are just uh, put arbitrary on the surface of, of the lake, uh, however, uh, on this picture, we can see the crystallization phenomena. The, the balls, they arrange themselves in a pattern. And so this is what I'm going to speak about today, the origin of uh, somehow maybe mathematical origins of crystallizations in nature. And so even though this is a very difficult uh, topic with many different uh, directions to go. So I will start with this rather basic setup. So suppose that we have a, a set of points in Euclidean space and uh, we fix some potential function P. And then the problem we would like to, uh, what we can do, we can uh, compute the P energy of uh, this point configuration. 
so um, it's defined as a sum of all pairwise energies, uh, energies of pairwise correlations between any two points. And for simplicity, uh, we assume that this energy it will depend only on the distance between two points. For example, on my picture here, we can imagine that these two points they have there is, there is a small between distance small distance between them, and so they interact strongly with each other. And for example, these two points, they are farther away. And so interaction between them is fading. However, our potential function does not, a priori does not have to be monotonic. It can give preference to certain distances. And so now we are looking at this problem very generally. And so also what we would like to do, we would like to, for the normalization reasons, uh, so let's uh, uh, divide by the number of uh, total number of points in our configuration so that this would be some average uh, interaction energy per one point. And so in Euclidean space, of course, considering only finite configurations is not very interesting. So what we would like to do, we would like to consider infinite uh, configurations or what comes from practical equations, usually that we consider finite, but very, very big configurations. And so when I've, if our uh, configuration in Euclidean space is infinite, uh, then uh, we, we want to, what we want to do, we want also to uh, compute this uh, average interaction energy per point. Uh, but here we run in all kind of analytical difficulties. So we have to be a bit careful with our definitions. And so what we do, well, we take our infinite configuration, we intersect it with a big ball around uh, origin. Then we compute the uh, this average uh, energy of this uh, small part of our configuration. And then we let the radius of the ball go to infinity. And so this limit, it might not exist for certain irregular configurations or for strange shapes of our energy profile P. Uh, so what we can always guarantee is this limit infimum. And so if, uh, this, if we have not just only a limit infimum, but if the honest limit exists, then we would say that our configuration C it has P, uh, P energy equal to this number. And so here, one thing I should say that from in many interesting, uh, important uh, energies and many important configurations, uh, even this limit would not exist. For example, if we consider Coulomb energy for periodic configurations, here more, di more difficult normalization procedure is needed. But for our purposes today, we will think of our energy profile P as the fast decaying energy profile and we would like to ignore all these con convergence issues. Uh, also, it's probably it's, uh, ambition is too big to consider all uh, possible kinds of configurations. So we would like to, for them also to be regular and nice. And one uh, requirement we have for our configuration is to have a density. And so we, if you, we want this limit to exist. So if we take an, our configuration and compute its number of points in a big ball around zero, uh, then the number of points per uh, uh, volume should converge to some number rho, which we call the density of our configuration. And so here are a few uh, examples. The so first nice uh, family of configurations are the lattices. So lattices, as we have seen them already on our very first slide, they are very regular configurations. Uh, and for for a lattice in Euclidean space, it's difficult. It's easy to compute its uh, density, and also it's uh, easy easier to compute the p energy because uh, all points they are equivalent to each other, and so the average energy it will be just the energy of one point in our configuration. And so there is a slightly more general uh, family of uh, configurations, uh, per periodic ones. So here we fix some lattice, and then we say that configuration is lambda periodic if it's uh, invariant under all translations with respect to this lattice. 
And for a periodic configuration, we can we also can compute its density. It will be just the number of uh, points of our configuration in any fundamental domain of the lattice decided by volume of this fundamental domain. And also the uh, P energy can be computed in the following way. So in periodic configuration, it's not true anymore that all points are equivalent to each other. However, there are there are only finitely many non uh, equivalent classes. And so we have to take only average over all uh, over our configuration modular the lattice lambda. And so this is this what happens if we simply apply our definition of the energy. And so in this second formula, it's a slightly nicer way to write uh, the energy, slightly simpler formula. But here I am cheating a little bit because here, I, as you remember, our energy, it was not defined if distance between two points is zero. So, but what I've done here, I've just defined my function at zero. It might be somehow not, the function doesn't have to be continuous. So I can just somehow insert this definition of the, what's the energy of uh, interaction between two points that coincide. And then this would be a slightly easier formula. And so now this is now the game we want to play is the potential energy minimization. And so it means that we are fixing a certain density because it would be unfair to, uh, to compare two configurations of different density and we fix a certain energy profile and then among uh, all configurations of fixed density, we are searching for those with uh, minimal P, P energy. And so if, uh, so if such a configuration C exists, which satisfies uh, this condition so that uh, any other configuration, so that C has well-defined P energy and any other configuration uh, the dimensional Euclidean space of the of same density, it will have a uh, lower P energy at, at least equal to the P energy of C. Then we also borrow this terminology from physics. We say that C is the ground state for P. And so now uh, the question we would like to ask, so suppose that we have our Euclidean space, we consider configurations of certain densities, but now we are changing our energy profile. And the question is how would uh, a ground states depend on the energy profile? And of, of course, if you write, uh, if you ask this question in a full generality, it's clear that uh, the dependence would be huge because if our uh, energy profile has some uh, exotic form, exotic shape, and for example, favors cert certain distances over others, then of course the its ground states would have to would need to have also this exotic behavior. Uh, however, uh, even if we, we can restrict ourselves to some nice family of uh, potentials, for example, we can consider Gaussian potentials. And so Gaussian potentials, they are nice functions, they, they are decaying, they, they are uh, first, second, and all their derivatives also behave in a regular way. So they are uh, re repelling uh, potentials. And so in this case, we might hope that uh, we, we could understand what's the dependence of uh, ground states on, uh, on this parameter alpha in the uh, Gaussian. And so let, here, let's consider one example. One example is the Gaussian core model in dimension three. And in dimension three, it turns out that the even for this family of potentials, the dependence can be rather complicated. So let's consider uh, configurations for of uh, density one. So 
and we are changing the parameter uh, alpha here. And so if uh, when alpha is uh, small, and so our, uh, so it means that energy almost does not change when we change the distance or changes very slowly, then we know that body central cubic lattice uh, is a good candidate and numerically it seems that it is indeed uh, the best solution, even though it's not, uh, there is no proof, mathematical proof of this fact. On the other hand, if this parameter alpha is uh, big, it means that the energy depends strongly on the distance. And then our problem becomes similar to the sphere packing problem. And in this case, we have another, uh, a good uh, candidate, which is the phase central cubic lattice. It is the sol solution of the sphere packing, one of the solutions of the sphere packing problem. And here, at least numerically, it seems that it is uh, the best solution for big values of alpha. And then when alpha is exactly equal to one, then we know that these two lattices, they will give exactly the same energy. And this happens because these two lattices, after they are normalized correctly, they are du dual to each other, like in a Poisson summation formula. So from the Poisson summation formula, we know that we know that E P1 of BCC, it will be the same as E P1 of and so if alpha is close to one here, we can actually uh, slightly get a slight improvement and uh, construct a new configuration, which is better than both BCC and FCC lattice. And uh, so the, I think this idea of this construction goes back to Maxwell and it works in the following way. So we are dividing our Euclidean space into uh, two parts, for example, two half spaces. And in one space, we are making uh, the density of our lattices slightly bigger. And in another half space, we make the density of our points slightly smaller. And so that the total density in the whole space would still be one. So total density is still one. So And then in one of these uh, half spaces, we, are, uh, we fill our uh, points so that they form a BCC lattice. And another half we form so that it uh, creates an FCC lattice. And so here it's a rather nice convexity argument, which tells us that if we choose uh, this uh, row one and row two in the right way, then we cre can create a new configuration, which is better than BCC and better than FCC. And so it, it seems that uh, in this, when alpha is close to one, we don't have a, a clear uh, candidate for, for the best configuration and the dependence of uh, this best configuration on uh, alpha can be very complicated. And of course, we are very far away from proving anything rigorously mathematically in this case. Uh, so uh, so I, what I've told you in the previous slide that uh, the shape of a ground state depends a lot on the energy profile. Uh, however, despite the example which I showed you, so Henry Kohn and Abhinav Kumar, they've made the following uh, definition. So they uh, say that uh, uh, this uh, configuration of points in Euclidean space with certain fixed density rho, it is universally optimal if it minimizes P energy for all completely monotonic functions of square distance. And here, so uh, completely monotonic, so means that means that it is a decaying function. Uh, so, so its first derivative is negative, its second derivative is positive, 
and so on. This holds for all derivatives of f. So it's if f has to be infinitely differentiable and So it's somehow, it means that F is a nice and regular uh, repelling potential. It looks something like this. So for example, uh, every Gaussian is a completely monotonic function. So So the uh, if alpha is a positive number, and actually the positive uh, this uh, the exponential uh, functions they span a whole space of completely monotonic functions. So it means that uh, 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 configuration C it is universally optimal if and only if it is a ground state for all uh, Gaussian potentials. And so in the same uh, paper where uh, Kohn and Kummer made this definition, they also uh, conjectured that the following four lattices are universally optimal. So first the lattice of integers, is universally optimal than the uh, hexagonal lattice A2 in dimension two is believed to be universally optimal. And same, uh, they conjectured that the E8 lattice in dimension eight and the Leach lattice in dimension 24 also satisfy same uh, condition. And so, uh, uh, Kohn and Kummer, they've proven the universal optimality of the lattice of integers, which is on one hand, it's not surprising uh, because what can be better than the lattice of integers? And on, on the other hand, what, what probably was surprising that it was, well, first it was not a uh, obvious uh, result, not an easy result. And also that it was still uh, like when uh, Kohn and Kummer got interested in these properties was still an open, Quick question. And so the result is that the, the result we have proven together with Henry Kohn, Abinav, Kumar, Stephen Miller, and Danilo Ratchenko is that the E8 lattice and the Leach lattice, they are universally optimal. And so Maybe one thing I would like to say that uh, the universal optimality of lattices, it also uh, implies that uh, they are uh, solutions to the sphere packing problem because this sphere packing problem, it is somehow a, a degenerate case of a, a minimization for the Gaussian potential when the potential becomes extremely steep. And so our strategy for the proof, it consists of uh, three components. Uh, so first, what we are using, we are using the uh, linear programming bounds uh, to, um, for the energy of the configuration. And then our linear programming bounds have to be sharp. And to achieve those, we have to uh, use a certain type of Fourier interpolation and finally, after the first two steps, we can reduce the uh, optimality of E8 and Leach lattice to a verification of a positivity of certain explicit function on a unit square. And so let me start with the linear programming. So the idea of linear programming is to uh, re reduce uh, uh, qu qu geometric optimization question to a uh, optimization question in uh, 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 conic optimization. So we want to linearize our problem. 
And so uh, this method has already been used uh, a lot for, for other geometric problems, for the kissing problem, for finding optimal spherical codes, for uh, proving optimality or for proving uh, bounds on the error correcting codes. And Kohn and Kumar, they have adapted this method to the energy minimization in Euclidean space. And so of course the difficulty to of working with Euclidean space is that it has infinite volume. And so uh, therefore it's a, a bit different from, uh, from working with compact spaces. And so this is the uh, theorem which uh, Kohn and Comer have proven. So suppose that we have an energy profile P and we want to estimate a minimal uh, P energy of a configuration with given density. And so we assume uh, for, for, to do this, we need to construct an auxiliary function. So this Schwartz function F. And the Schwartz function has to satisfy several inequalities. Uh, so first, this function should not exceed our uh, function P. Uh, then the Fourier transform of F has to be non-negative. And then if we are able to uh, construct such a function, then we know that uh, the lower P energy of, uh, of, of a subset in Euclidean space is bounded by this number, which uh, linearly depends on our function F. So we would like to maximize this uh, linear functional of F uh, subject to these two uh, uh, inequ inequalities it has to satisfy. And so here's an idea of the proof of the uh, uh, theorem of Kohn and Kummer. Uh, so, Suppose so here let's let's do this proof for periodic configurations. So let uh, C be a periodic configuration of given density rho. Then we can compute the energy of uh, C in this way by su such a sum. So at this step we are using the fact that uh, uh, P is uh, bounded by F from below. Here we use that bounded by F. And so in the next step, we are just re slightly rewriting our sum. And then in the next step, we are using the Poisson summation. And so in, uh, in the next uh, step, what we do, we are uh, rewriting this double sum here as an absolute value squared of this uh, uh, simple sum. And so this is, so to say, the main, the main trick of our proof. And so that the next step, we use the fact that F the Fourier transform of F is non-negative. And so at the last step, we get the inequality we were looking for. So this finishes the proof of the uh, theorem of Kohn and Elkis. And so I should say that this proof we have done, it was rather wasteful proof. So we have uh, thrown away many terms which could have been uh, positive. Uh, and so therefore in general, we don't hope for a, a sharp bounds obtained by this method. So they, this method always gives us some estimate, but in general, uh, this estimate should, there is no reason why this estimate should be sharp. 
Uh, however, uh, in the case of the E8 lattice and Leach lattice, and also we hope that in the case of uh, the hexagonal lattice, even though we cannot prove it, uh, we believe that the con so so for hexagonal lattice we believe, and for the E8 lattice and Leach lattice we know the the theorem of Con uh, uh, and Kumar does give a sharp linear programming bounds, and so. So let's analyze in which cases that's possible. So suppose that we have a lattice and that we know that this lattice minimizes P energy for some energy profile P. And also we suppose that the optimality can be proven by linear programming using a function F, a function F which satisfies all the requirements of the previous theorem. And then if in the proof of theorem, we did not have any uh, losses in our inequalities, it would mean that all the terms which we have uh, thrown away, they have to be uh, zero. So in particular, it means that the uh, value of function f has to be equal to the value of function p at all non-zero vectors of our lattice. And also the values of the Fourier transform of f, it has to be exactly zero and not just non-negative at the all non-zero vectors of the lattice dual to lambda. And also the inequalities, they have to hold to the second order. And so now it turns out that knowing this information about function f, it is already sufficient to reconstruct it. And so this is the theorem which we've proven uh, together with uh, Henry, Abinov, Steven, and Danilo. So here, let uh, we consider the dimensions to be either eight or 24, and then this number n0, which depends on the dimension, it would be either one or two, and this number, it's, so it corresponds to the shortest length of the shortest vector in the optimal lattice. And so we prove that we have a collection of uh, radial Schwartz functions, so the a n b n a n tilde b n tilde, such that for every function f, which is a radial Schwartz function, the value of function at point x can be reconstructed from the values of this function at the uh, square roots of even integers, the values of its derivative, at the same points, the values of its Fourier transform at the square roots of even integers and the value and the derivative of its Fourier transform at the same points. And so what we know that this series, they uh, converge absolutely. So if we know all these values, then we would also know the function f. And so in the case of uh, the magic function, actually we do know all these values because we know that magic function f has to satisfy with the energy profile P at all these points. So maybe I would like to make a few words about uh, the Fourier interpolation. So it turns out that the Fourier interpolation formula from the uh, Previous slide, it's not lonely, and actually there are. It prob probably it fits in a much much bigger family of uh, uh, formulas of that kind. Even though at the moment there are very few of them which we can obtain explicitly, and so together with uh, Danilo Ratchenko, we have computed an analog of this formula. Only here, instead of uh, having uh, interpolation of second order at po points. Uh, uh, at square roots of even integers. In this paper, we uh, have computed the interpolation of the first order. And from the points like this, so we take, we have to know the values of our function at all uh, square, simply square roots of integers, but we don't need to know the value of its derivative. So we have, so to say, uh, twice the, our set of points is twice bigger, but the amount of information we collect is twice smaller. 
Also, there is a very interesting uh, result by uh, Bandarian, Karachenka, and Saip, where they proven certain version of uh, Fourier interpolation formula from the zeros of L functions. So there, this uh, formula is not for Schwartz functions, it's for different class of functions, but still somehow what is interesting about this formula, it's also an explicit formula. And then there are a few results of other kind, which tells us that actually in the formula like this, we can, uh, we can perturb the nodes. So instead of considering these uh, nodes with uh, like algebraic structure, we can add certain disturbance to each of the node. And then we will still, this uh, Schwartz functions, they would still exist, even though in this case, we will not have a nice, for example, integral representation for them. We will simply know their existence from a, a kind of perturbation methods. And then there is an interesting uh, result. I think the paper was not published yet, but there are a few, several talks on YouTube uh, about uh, which like, consider this problem of free interpolation much more general and prove at least the existence of interpolation uh, for a very wide class of nodes. And here, no special algebraic structure is needed. The only thing which is needed is that the density of, there is a correct density of nodes. Then we know that we would have the Fourier interpolation. So this maybe was a bit of a detour from the main topic of, uh, of our, of what I wanted to talk about. So uh, let me now continue with the proof. So, so after we know that the interpolation formula exists, and uh, now what we can do, we can uh, reconstruct back our magic function f from, from the potential function. So, and then it will look like this. So if we imagine that we have this interpolating basis A and B N in some explicit form, then we would also have the magic function F in, uh, in this rather explicit form. And so now if you want to prove that, for example, E8 lattice or Leach lattice minimizes P energy, it would be sufficient to check the two conditions which are posed on the magic pump function by the Kohn-Kummer theorem. So we would have to check that uh, F does not exceed P and we would have to check that the Fourier transform of F is non-negative. Non uh, and so as I already told you that if uh, configuration is a ground state for every Gaussian, then it also will be a ground state for every completely monotonic function of squared distance. So it is if you want to check that E8 lattice and Leach lattice are universally optimal, it's sufficient to check these two conditions for all Gaussians. And so now uh, what we would like to do, I would like to find an explicit formula for the magic function f. And in order to do so, uh, we would have to, uh, have to compute the ele elements of the interpolating basis. And so let's consider such a generating function, capital F. So this is a generating function of uh, our uh, elements in the basis, the one function for function for capital F for A, N, and B, N, and F tilde for A, N tilde, and B, N tilde. And so this normalization is introduced for the convenience reasons, which will become obvious in a moment. So now this, uh, the shape of this uh, interpolating function is tuned in such a way that the, if we would like to write down the interpolation formula for a complex Gaussian, Gaussian with this complex parameter tau, where tau is a point at the upper half plane. Uh, then this interpolation formula will be equivalent to this functional equation satisfied by the gen generating functions f and f tilde. 
And so also this uh, generating function, we will see that it coincides with our uh, magic function uh, for uh, for this real for the for the real Gaussian. So if we take, for example, for, uh, take a function f, and here instead of tau, we substitute a point on the imaginary axis, point i t, then it will be the only possible candidate for a magic function for this uh, potential. And so now, uh, for our functions f and f tilde, we have a system of uh, functional equations. So we, on the previous slide, we have already seen that uh, this function satisfy a, an equation like this. And also these two equations, they follow uh, from the shape of uh, our generating functions. So both functions, they are, so to say, linearly periodic. And also, they satisfy this symmetry condition. And so now, the, if we can prove that uh, this, if we were able to compute f explicitly and show that it has a moderate growth as a function of its first variable, then we would be able to we will be able to reconstruct all the analytic details of the interpolation formula. For example, we will be able to reconstruct the, to prove the convergence. And finally, there is one more simplification. So as we, you remember in the uh, Conkumer theorem, we had two conditions which have to be satisfied by the uh, magic function. But now if you look at all the uh, functions f for all possible values of tau and also use the Poisson summation formula in a uh, smart way, then we will see that uh, it's sufficient to prove only this one uh, inequality, not both of them, but only only this one, and it will imply the uh, universal optimality of the E8 lattice and of Leach lattice. And so, as I promised to you, so we will construct the function f explicitly, and so from the uh, theory of uh, automorphic forms, we know how to solve the uh, functional equations of this type. So we just need to somehow use this machine in the right way. And so we will search for uh, our uh, function capital F uh, in this form. So we, as, we, will, we assume that our function F will have this integral representation. And so here, this kernel k, it will be a certain uh, a function of two variables, uh, which satisfies uh, certain, certain modularity properties. So okay, we will have kernels k and k hat, which will be defined on the h, it would be the upper half plane. So there are two meromorphic kernels. Modularity properties. And so what I mean by modularity properties, I mean that they will have nice uh, symmetries, nice transformation rules with respect to the modular group. So this is the modular group SL2Z. It's a group of two by two uh, matrices with integer coefficients. So this group acts on the upper half plane by linear fractional transformations. And so for each, uh, function on the upper half plane, we will introduce a so-called slash operator. So because if, if the group acts on a upper half plane, then of course it also acts on a, a functions on the upper half plane. And the only thing which is new here is this uh, weight. So it will act on, on the function by pullback, but 
will also multiply by this automorphy factor. And so we'll see that our kernels uh, K and K hat, they will have nice behavior with respect to such uh, slash operators of uh, suitable weight. And so for first thing which we can do, we can replace our write our functional equations for F and F tilde now using this new uh, notation. So for example, uh, this formula will express this almost periodicity or linear periodicity of function F and same will be true for function F tilde. And so the last equation can be expressed in this way. So the first two equations are related to the action of this upper triangular matrix on the upper half plane. And the last equation is related to the action of this element, which is an well, involution in the, uh, at least pro pro projectively, it's an, in, in, so it's, it's, uh, act, it acts by involution on the upper half plane. And so, and this is a slightly, uh, so here we had uh, these equations with two functions and here we can rewrite it only with one, with one function. And so in this proposition, we st state the properties of our meromorphic kernels. And so we say that there exists the unique meromorphic kernel K, uh, which would satisfy all these properties. Uh, so first it is, uh, it will have uh, poles only at the points where uh, tau and z are equivalent under the action of uh, SL to z. And it will have only simple poles. Uh, then our uh, kernel, it will satisfy this functional equation. So the same equation as the equation satisfied by function f. Also, we require that uh, uh, the uh, residues of uh, function k at its simple poles uh, is of a certain particular shape. And this particular shape is prescribed by our choice of integral representation for the function f. So it's a certain explicit function, which I don't include in this slide. And finally, we also have to put some uh, gross conditions uh, of K as uh, uh, one of its variables tau or Z would approach the boundary of the upper half plane. So the boundary, it also has to be a meromorphic function with uh, certain uh, restrictions on the order of its poles. And so now what is important that after, after we list all these conditions, these both kernels, they can be uh, explicitly computed in terms of modular forms. And so here in this slide, I recall the uh, classical modular objects, which will be our building blocks for uh, finding explicit formula for the kernel K. And so here are the uh, Eisenstein series, the Ramanujan delta function, the J invariant, so all this fun uh, and the Eisenstein series of weight two, which is a so-called quasi-modular form. Also, we will need uh, what is called the modular forms of level two. So, so uh, Jacobi-Tita functions, so the classical objects so given as a sums over lattice of uh, integers. And also another important function we would have, it would be a, a modular lambda function. And we will also use a logarithm of modular lambda function. So we'll choose one particular branch of this uh, logarithm. And so now our, uh, what we pr pr prove is that uh, our function uh, F tilde, it has such an integral representation and this representation, it will uh, converge if tau is in certain domain, domain D, where D is a subset of the upper half plane. And what is important about D that it is a, that the, axis uh, uh, of, uh, imaginary axis is contained in D, so it's a domain like this. 
what exact shape is not so important for us, but it's important that the uh, imaginary axis is contained in D. And also this integral representation, it will converge uh, for uh, if R is uh, the length of a vector is big enough. So, and if uh, uh, we consider dimension eight, then this integral will converge for all positive values of R. And if uh, uh, dimension is 24, then it will converge only for uh, R big or equal than square root of two. And so now, as you remember, so to prove optimality, we, we, we would like to prove the, that this function is positive if tau is an imaginary axis. And so it turns out that we, uh, we can um, do this by showing that uh, the this kernel k hat is positive, which will immediately imply the positivity of f. And in dimension 24, there is a bit more work to be done. And so uh, now if you want to prove the positivity of uh, the kernel K, what we need to do, the last step we need to do, we need to find an explicit formula for this kernel K. And so our kernel K, it was, uh, we first, we found its expression in terms of this uh, uh, function. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven different functions at the upper half plane. And then we restrict them to the uh, imaginary axis. And so this is where we have to prove the uh, positivity of our kernel K. And, but now to make our computations feasible, what we will last step, what we will do, we will express all these functions in terms of the values of lambda function at the imaginary axis. And so this can be done with the help of classical functions, so-called elliptic integrals. And so each of the functions on our list, it is expressed the function of a value of lambda function with help of uh, logarithms and two elliptic integrals. And so for example, so in the case of dimension eight, so it's actually the same is true for dimension 24 is that we can compute this function uh, L8, and also we can compute the function L24, uh, which is a function defined on the unit square. And uh, so then the value of uh, uh, kernel K at the point tau and Z is equal to the value of function L evaluated at the uh, lambda of tau and lambda of Z, if uh, tau and Z are both on the imaginary axis. And so we see that this function can be expressed in terms of uh, functions like this. And so this is how the function L8 looks like. And so the, uh, so we see that uh, of course it's not very difficult, but also not, not very simple. Uh, and the code for dimension 24 is even longer. And so as we, it seems that this function does not have any particular structure to make its uh, positivity obvious. And so here we have to go to the brutal force methods and uh, to estimate the values of this function numerically. And so at this slide, we can see the a plot of function L so it's at first time we have some good news. So we see that the function L, it is, looks like it is positive on the square where we need to prove positivity. At the same time, we also see that it's not an easy function. So here it's first it, because of uh, its 
it's we have a pre presentation like this, and this presentation contains uh, this factor. It means that uh, like our uh, function, so this part of our function, it vanishes if x and y, if point x, y belongs to one of the diagonals of the square. And so this part also vanishes. So we have to divide zero by zero and we have this, so to say, virtual singularity along two diagonals. Also, we see that along one of the edges, our function goes to infinity and in other, on other edges of the uh, square, it seems that it is vanishing. And so it's here at this corners, it has rather unpleasant singularities. And so in this picture, I just write how the function behaves as we approach edges of the, of the square. And so it means that when we check the positive positivity of the function, uh, it's, we, we don't have one uniform approach which will prove uh, positivity everywhere. So we have to use the interval arithmetic and we this interval arithmetic, it works differently at different parts of our square. So we have the uh, strategy for, for a generic point in our square. We have a, a separate strategy for, for diagonal for diagonals and also uh, intersection of two diagonals is extra work. Also, if you, when we are at edges, we need a special uh, need a different algorithm to verify that everything is fine near the edges. And finally, most difficult parts are this uh, the small squares because it's where uh, in each of these squares, so like three singularities intersect. And so this is uh, this last part of the work, it was done computationally. So now uh, Henry uh, Cohen and Abhinav Kumar, they have developed a rather fast algorithm and it verifies the positivity uh, like an usual computer, like a laptop, laptop within an hour. So now the computational part works very fast. And so at the end of my talk, I would like maybe to address some open questions which still arise. So first is for universal optimality. We know that the Z lattice, the E8 lattice and the Leach lattice are universally optimal. And we are pretty sure that the hexagonal lattice is universally optimal as well. But then interesting question is, is there anything else? So for example, is it true that D4 is universally optimal? And also there is an interesting configuration in dimension nine, which also might be universally optimal. Another interesting question is more general. So for which uh, pro interesting problems can we hope for sharp linear programming bounds? And so where can we search for more examples? So we already know that some examples come in as from geometric optimization. Recently, there have been example from conformal field theory, from uncertainty principles, but maybe we can add something more to this list. And the last also interesting open question is uh, how the Fourier interpolation formulas uh, work. Because at the moment we have several examples, we have examples of, say, of algebraic nature with very rigid structure of nodes and uh, where we can compute uh, the uh, interpolating basis rather explicitly. And we, however, we know that this is only somehow isolated points in a sea of much bigger number of inter interpolation formulas, which exist for uh, random nodes with no structure. And here the result yeah, so they are somehow proven by perturbative methods and much more flexible. But the question is how can we, uh, how can we use them? How can we construct them and prove interesting estimates with them? So this is all I wanted to say for today. So thank you very much. Maybe you have some questions. Thanks, thanks a lot, Marina, for this very interesting lecture. So uh, 
In fact, uh, I'm sure that many participants would like to, uh, to ask questions or to make comments. I have already seen one by offer, but as I said, we don't have time. So we will pass on the questions to you, which are on the chat. And uh, now we will go immediately uh, to diffuse a short video about the case of Azat Miftakov. So uh, could you, Marina, please stop sharing so I share the video? Yes, yes. Okay. Ooh. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I want to say that Azat Miftahov's court case and his uh, and its outcome caused a strong outrage in everything who know who knew about it. Azat received a serious sentence, six years. But as it obvious now, the court had not and has not any proof of his unlawful activity, and he is guilty. The only witness, unreliable at that, has disappeared. Possibly the court is aware that Azad does not share political views and evaluation of events uh, as Russian propaganda has them. And he is not even trying to conceal this fact. It's uh, apparent that this is quite enough for the court in order to throw him into prison. Recently, the Russian authorities and their court system in particular are more and more obvious turning into the copy of Soviet Stalinist system and are drifting further and further away 
from the civilized norm. The Miftahov case is an uh, obvious demonstration of uh, this fact. I believe it is extremely important that Western scholars and politicians participate in campaign on behalf of the unlawfully persecuted Russian citizens. I would like to remind that quite recently, all educated people in the world marked the 100th anniversary of outstanding scholars and personality Andrei Dmitrich Sakharov. His activity was uh, in, in hum for human rights protection was obvious uh, uh, for obvious reason viewed as hostile by the Soviet power and as it clear now by the current Russian power also. Andrei Dmitrich tried to create a unified front of scholars, academics, cultural and technological elites in order to stand against the worldwide police state uh, mentality that denigrates and persecutes people uh, uh, everywhere in and any time when it's possible. This is why many of us are inspired but your, my friends, participation in the def defense of, uh, of the uh, one who is being persecuted now. My name is Fabien Durand and I am the president of the SMF, the French Mathematical Society. The SMF is committed to supporting the human rights of mathematicians around the world based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Azat Miftakov is a doctoral student at the Moscow State University. He was arrested in February 2019 in Moscow on a putative vandalism charge. He pleaded not guilty and denied the charges against him. Moreover, credible reports also indicate that Azat Miftakov has been subjected to considerable mistreatment while incarcerated. On January the 18th of this year, Azat Miftakov was declared guilty on the charge of hooliganism and sentencing him to six years in prison to be served in a general regime penal colony. SMF claims this sentence is a nonsense and is unfair. The sentence was confirmed these days in June 9th at the Moscow Appeal Court. The SMF strongly believe Azat Miftakov is innocent and is convinced this confirmation is a huge injustice. With this video, we express our solidarity with Azat and ask its release. Thank you. 
Azad. I'm a mathematician. You are a mathematician. My freedom has been restricted. Your freedom is restricted. In solidarity, together, we will make you free. In solidarity, we will struggle against the tyrants of the 21st century for peace, justice, and democracy. The criminal proceedings against me are one huge injustice. From my initial detention, in which I was tortured, to the conviction verdict based on the testimony of a secret witness and whose severity is completely unjustified. With this entire process, the state and its strongmen persecute me for my political views and for their expression. Nevertheless, I received enormous public support that I felt all the time I was imprisoned. In this last word, I would like to thank all those who contributed to this support. My special thanks go to Elena Gorban, who is also a defendant in this criminal, criminal case. Her help has been active since the very first days of my detention and remains so to this day. She organizes a collection of cash as of assistance for me. With this money, she orders me food, books, and delivers parcels and transfers them to me every week. Lena also regularly provides me with up-to-date news about what is happening in the world, which is very important for me. Without a doubt, her contribution, her contribution to my support cannot be overestimated. Also, I would like to thank all those who transferred money for my support. Without you, there wouldn't be such good deliveries and parcels that I have received all this time. I am grateful to the mathematical communities that have demanded that my perse persecution be stopped. I was very pleased to be supported by world-renowned scientists. I am especially grateful to Professor of Mathematics Alexander Bufetov for the scientific correspondence with me, thanks to which my la latest mathematical publications appeared. The complex math problems I get from him in this correspondence are what I especially need during my incarceration. I would like to thank everyone who supported me by sending me letters and postcards with warm words. I have received a huge number of them during the time I have been in prison. I was often told how persistent and courageous I am, but to, to be honest, there were moments when I became terribly sad in prison and your letters helped me overcome this longing. I apologize for not answering most people. Please understand, there were a lot of letters and I just didn't have time to answer anyone. But I read absolutely all the letters and postcards with great pleasure. My se separate thanks go to journalist Natalia Demina, who not only covered my criminal prosecution, but also for a year and a half every week provides me with the latest issues of Trinity Variant and Interlocutor, which I read with great interest. I would also like to note the brilliant work of my attorney, Svetlana Sidorkina. Punctuality, good preparation for meetings and excellent argumentation are all about her. In addition, she made my case public, which provided me with even more support. From Svetlana Ivanovna, I received not only legal assistance and publicity, but also moral support. In pre-COVID times, when the entrance to the pre-trial detention center was not very limited, she visited me almost every week. And we, having no news about the progress of the case at the time, just talked to each other heartily. Those conversations greatly cheered me up. Many thanks go to the numerous activists who took part in various actions and events in my support. Some of them risk their studies, their comfort, and even their freedom. Among such brave people were both anarchists and members of student movements, and people who were just not indifferent to my fate. I was glad to see that. Despite the increasing scale of repression, such people continue to protest. And of course, Thank you very much to all my family and friends for their love and care, which I never stopped receiving while in prison. Their cohesion, 
contrary to the tragedy associated with my detention, is worthy of respect. Special thanks to my mother and my uncle for their active participation in publicizing my case. Having gotten into the millstone of justice, I faced the aggressive power of the state represented by the law enforcement agencies and the Kremlin propagandists. But at the same time, I received enormous public support, thanks to which I felt all the time that the truth was on my side and that everything I was doing was not for nothing. And this gives me hope that Russia will be free very soon. And with it, dozens, if not hundreds, of political prisoners of our country will be free. Okay, so thanks to all the colleagues who contributed to this moving video and a very special thank to Raphael Rouquier who edited the video. Uh, I apologize for the small technical problems in the beginning. The video will be uh, soon available on our webpage and our YouTube channel. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce the third speaker, Alexander Bouffetov from CNRS and Institut de Mathematique de Marseille. Steklov Institute and IITP Russian Academy of Sciences, who will speak on determinantal point processes, quasi symmetries, minimality, and interpolation. Sasha, you have the microphone. Could you please unmute my, your microphone and put on your camera? Okay, the microphone is okay. Could you put the camera? Okay. Okay, it's so. Very good, thank you. So you have the microphone. Azatlik Giu Eleftheria Horea Libertas Freehet Volnest Svoboda Svobodu, Azatu, Miftahu. So we start with the key point process of random matrix theory, uh, the sign process. Uh, and uh, uh, just uh, this is the sign kernel that we have on the blackboard. The sign kernel, uh, we, uh, its appearance I will motivate uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, corresponds to the projection on the Pele Wiener space, whose uh, uh, definition, uh, whose definition is recalled here. So the Pele Wiener space of functions uh, whose Fourier transform has uh, support on the interval minus pi pi, and uh, so this is the orthogonal projection. And in fact, it will be important for the evolution of this talk uh, that just this operator is a spectral. A projection. It's a spectral projection corresponding to the uh, differential operator of taking the second derivative. Okay, so uh, let me formulate immediately the main result of the talk, and then I will recall the necessary definitions. So the question, so the sign process is a measure on the space of configurations on the real line, that is to say, on the space of infinite subsets of the real line without accumulation points. And so if we have such a subset, the question is, what does the subset sampled with respect to the measure know about the underlying functional space, the Pele Wiener space in this example? And this is the main result of the talk that in fact, 
the subset, the random subset, it's an infinite subset with one particle removed, with one particle removed is in fact a uniqueness set for the Paley Wiener space. That is to say that any Paley Wiener function, if it is zero in restriction to the configuration minus one particle, is in fact the identically zero function. Let us not forget that Pelevinner functions are entire functions and therefore uh, all this writing makes perfect sense. And as I hope to uh, convince you uh, uh, during the talk, the key step in the argument is in fact the quasi invariance of the sign process under a sufficiently large group of diffeomorphisms of the line uh, that is to say that a certain analog of the definite theorem is valid for the sign process. Okay, so let me just also introduce one of the main characters of the talk, uh, namely, so uh, let me formulate a certain converse to this result. Uh, that is that if two particles are removed from a realization of the sign process, uh, then uh, in fact, it is no longer a uniqueness set for the Paley Wiener space, in fact, a very explicit function, a very explicit function can be written. Here it is. Uh, a very explicit infinite product convergent in principal value. Uh, it's a function in T and X are the particles of the configuration. This function, it's an entire function. It's in fact a Paley Wiener function. And by its very definition, it is uh, zero at all the particles except two. In fact, uh, the, what, what one needs is to prove that it is indeed a Paley Wiener function. So uh, the key property uh, on which all the analysis revolves is that the sign process has determinantal correlation functions. Determinantal correlation functions here they're written. The correlation functions are the determinants of the sign kernel. And in fact, this very definition can be seen as stemming from the wild character formula. And please allow me to explain this. So. I should say, while I erase, that in its most general form, the study of point processes can be taken back to the work of John Grant in 1662. So he was studying uh, mortality in London. So how deaths of Londoners were distributed among the different neighborhoods of London. And so precisely the uh, occurrences of indistinguishable events uh, in this uh, specific case uh, deaths of Londoners uh, occurring at random at random positions at random time and random positions in space is essentially the first example of a point process so the theory received great impetus with the development of phone lines in fact one of the key protagonists of the general theory uh, Conrad Palm was not a mathematician, but an engineer for Ericsson in Stockholm. And in fact, his work was mathematized by Alexander Hinchin in the Soviet Union. But so, uh, and next, of course, the theory received a great impetus in the work of the late uh, Sir Freeman Dyson, who, uh, who started to study matrices whose entries are given by chance. And in fact, this concept of a matrix whose entries are given by chance has proved extremely fruitful both for the theory and in applications. In fact, all predictions of random matrix theory have received very substantial experimental verification. So following Dyson, let us consider the unitary group UN and to a matrix in the unitary group, let's assign its spectrum, spectrum of U. So the spectrum is let us consider it as a configuration on the torus. So in fact, it is not really, it is not really a point on the torus. It is a point on the quotient of the torus under the action of the symmetric group. We neglect uh, um, matrices with uh, degenerate eigenvalues. And uh, just this, the measure on this space, I point out that, of course, the difference between the torus and the quotient is not observable on the finite level, but on the infinite level, it becomes quite important. Uh, configurations are unordered subsets. So uh, the, spec the measure on the spectrum precisely by the vile character formula, vile character formula, 
is just the product like this. And one observes without difficulty that this product can be reformulated, can be rewritten in determinantal form where dn is the Dirichlet kernel. So uh, the Dirichlet kernel and uh, just uh, extremely important that this determinantal form is preserved by taking projections by taking projections that is to say the projection of this measure on the subset with fewer variables so we just forget about one of the eigenvalues it is strictly speaking not a map but a multi-map but let's skip these details uh, just the projection projection of this measure on the first k on the first l coordinates onto first l coordinates uh, let's say r coordinates again have this very same determinantal form which is a lovely exercise if you have to give an exam in linear algebra for your students so just uh it is called the genibre meta theorem genibre meta theorem so precisely this determinantal form of the projections uh, so here i have kl from one to n and here I will have KL from one to R. So this determinantal form of the correlation functions allows one to undertake the scaling limit. So Dyson places himself on the unit circle and he observes the eigenvalues around him. So obviously we are on the unit circle and the matrix has size n. So the different the distance between neighboring and eigenvalues is one over n so he scales by a factor of n and well if one does the obvious change of variable one notes that the sign here disappears and one gets so under scaling limit scaling limit one gets precisely the sign kernel the sign kernel and furthermore, the determinantal property for the correlation function. So the number of particles grows, but the correlation functions, the correlation function being the infinitesimal probability of finding a path, let's say the third correlation function is the infinitesimal probability of finding a particle in each of these intervals. And of course, it doesn't matter how many more particles there are. So there may be a million or a billion particles, but we are just interested in, the, in, in whether each of these three infinitesimal intervals contains a particle. And at this point, it's a determinant three times three, whether we have a million, a billion, or infinitely many particles. And this precise remark allows one to take the scaling limit and to consider the sign process on the space of infinite configurations. Well, obviously, under scaling, the circle becomes the line. So we have. Uh, we have a uh, what was written before we have a measure on the space of infinite subsets of the line without accumulation points so configurations on the line and uh, the correlation functions are given by the determinantal formula which was already here before because precisely they admit the scaling limit and the key point here is this determinantal property and in fact, the idea of studying, of axiomatizing on this determinantal property is due to the French physicist Odile Maquis. She wrote this very beautiful paper in 1973. In 1973, she used the terminology fermionic processes because it was supposed to model fermions, but this uh, terminology uh, gradually stopped being used. So, and then uh, really it turned out that this axiomatization on the determinantal property. So consider a point process is following John Grant, consider a point process that is to say, 
a measure on the space of subsets, in this case of the line, uh, consider a, a point process whose correlation functions are given by determinants. This has turned, uh, this has turned out to be a very good uh, level of uh, abstraction, a very good level of generality in the sense that on the one hand, it encompasses very many examples of completely different nature, spanning trees, zeros of random analytic functions that I will formulate more precisely in a moment, uh, obviously random matrices, uh, uh, and many, many, many more. So uh, representations, decomposing measures for representations of infinite dimensional groups in the work of Borodina Dalshansky, and many, many, many more. So. Uh, the random permutations in the work of Johansson and by Dave Johansson and also Bradian Konkov and Alshansky. So many, many examples on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is possible to construct in this case a general theory which is sufficiently rich and contains a sufficient number of general results precisely in this generality. For example, palm measures by the Shirai Takahashi theorem, uh, palm measures of determinant process are determinantal. So, uh, and uh, uh, there is a central limit theorem of Soshnikov in great generality for determinantal point processes. There is a large, this balance between examples and the general theory. Let me just formulate one more example, which we will briefly touch upon in this talk. So let us consider the unit disk and let us consider, so this is the Perez Virag theorem. Perez Virag theorem. So. So let us consider the unit disk and let us consider a random power series, AN, ZN, where AN are independent standard complex Gaussians. So the, the ANs are random variables. Let me to stress independence on the random parameter. Let me write AN of omega, omega being the randomness. These are independent complex Gaussians. I consider this power series and I consider it zero set. It is immediate from your favorite criterion for the radius of convergence that the radius of convergence of this power series is equal to one. And in fact, we assign to this power series, it's zero set. So the zero set is a configuration. So it obviously, it's obviously infinite and it does accumulate, but it only accumulates on the boundary of the unit disk. So, and in fact, very remarkably, very remarkably, uh, this point process is a determinantal point process corresponding to the kernel KZW, which is one over pi one minus ZW bar square, which is nothing else but the Bergman kernel, the kernel introduced by Stefan Bergman uh, of uh, projection onto the space of functions K from L2 on the disk onto the space of holomorphic functions on the disk. Holomorphic L2, let me write like this. So it is in fact holomorphic L2, it is, which is in fact the Bergman space. Holomorphic L2. So the, on the Bergman space, this is the operator of orthogonal projection on the Bergman space. There are many proofs of this very beautiful theorem. There is a very beautiful proof due to Manjunat Krishnapur, where he identifies these particles with eigenvalues of a corner of a random unitary matrix. So in fact, random matrices do make an appearance in this theorem too. So let me point out that from this theorem, so we can view uh, just the unit disk as the Poincare disk, the model for the Lobachevsky plane. And in fact, the distribution of the zeros is invariant under Lobachevsky anisometries, which is completely not obvious because the distribution of the function is not. So uh, the distribution of the zeros is invariant under the Lobachevsky anisometries, and it is in fact, uh, it helps analysis a lot. These symmetries of infinite, uh, these infinite dimensional measures, their symmetries help the analysis a lot. And in fact, they are quasi symmetries, which I mentioned earlier also. So let us start now with the question. So in, for the purposes of this talk, uh, I will only consider determinant point processes of which the kernel, the function of two variables, induces an orthogonal projection. So in fact, it remains an open question. It remains an open question when, when does a kernel induce a determinant point processes? 
But there is a very convenient sufficient condition by Maki Soshnikov and also by Shirai Takahashi, also by Shirai Takahashi. So which says that if the kernel, uh, if the two the function of two variables is a kernel of a projection, a kernel of a projection satisfying some assumptions, locally finite trace. Let's just in our in all our examples, it will be the kernels will be continuous and more. So if the kernel is an orthogonal projection, then the process exists. So this is not this is not necessary. There are examples of determinable processes which do not satisfy the Makisoshnikov theorem, but this is the only general result, at least that I know. So, and now the question can be formulated in more general terms. And in fact, this question was formulated by Lyons and Paris and Lyons worked on it. And there is also Gosh settled this question for the sign process itself. Uh, the question can be raised. The question can be raised. What does the realization of the point process know about the kernel? So in this case, it is S, in this case, it is K, uh, the Bergman kernel. What does the realization of the point process know about the kernel? Let me formulate this question in different terms, availing myself of this specific example. In fact, one easily verifies that this series is not square integrable. This series is not square integrable. One computes, one gets the harmonic series. So does there exist? But on the other hand, a zero set does not uniquely define a function which is zero on this set. One can play with the Weierstrass pr product, add exponential factors. There is a certain amount of liberty. So this series is divergence. One gets the harmonic series uh, if one applies the Kolmogorov to series theorem. But maybe there does exist a square integrable, square integrable function which is zero at all these points. Well, in fact, no. And uh, this is our result in joint work with uh, uh, Xu and Shamov. Shu and Shamov. So just in fact, we prove it in complete generality, but the Bergman case is the first case in which is the, how to say, the first example in which it was not known because in many, so in joint work with Shu and Shamov. So realization of, realization of a determinantal point process is a uniqueness set of a determinantal point process is a uniqueness set is a uniqueness set for the underlying space the underlying function space so for example for the uh, Gaussian zero set it's the Bergman space and for the sign process it's the Pele Wiener space and there are also many other examples for the Ginebra process, the Fox space, and so forth. So it's a uniqueness set. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, work on this, uh, this statement uh, is a conjecture by Lyons and Paris. And there has been very important earlier work by Lyons and by Gosch. So, and uh, uh, Lyons proved this in the discrete setting for processes which, are, which have a discrete uh, countable phase space. And in fact, we started from the work of Lyons. Uh, and just the key point for us was, in fact, uh, that the conditional kernel, so the key point for us, I mentioned already that palm measures of determinant point processes are themselves determinantal. And in fact, we prove this is the main lemma for us that conditional measures of determinant point processes are themselves determinantal. Conditional measures of determinant point processes are themselves determinantal. It's the key lemma in the paper. And in fact, the key step is the martingale property for these conditional kernels, the martingale property for these conditional kernels, which is the key technical step in this paper. And here, please allow me to pursue a little digression. So uh, the martingale, martingales taking values in function spaces is a very well studied, in depth studied topic. So, but in fact, uh, I needed what seemed a very simple statement, which, however, I couldn't prove. 
uh, and that was uh, uh, the Hölder property for martingales taking values in Hölder function. So, and in fact, I wrote to Azat Miftakov asking this question, and surely soon enough, I received the answer where he had a full solution written in his uh, beautiful handwriting, which you saw uh, on the board. And just somehow then, well, obviously, one just needed to uh, put that, to type that and put that on the archive. Please allow me also to say that the key difficulty in corresponding about mathematics with Azat Miftahov was, in fact, the censorship. So uh, it is uh, the system of correspondence between a prisoner in a Russian gale and uh, somebody outside works really very well. So there is a system, one sends a letter, uh, one pays a very moderate fee, uh, and it is delivered very quickly. And uh, then uh, the uh, prisoner sends a handwritten response, uh, the one you saw on the board, and uh, well, then one continues. The difficulty, however, is that the system, the correspondence system, is also subject to law, specifically subject to censorship. And since the censor cannot be expected to speak foreign languages, foreign languages are expressly forbidden, and that includes mathematical formulas. So, in fact, in the very first letter which Azat Miftakov sent me, there was what I assume was the Vandermonde determinant, but I will never know because it was duly erased by the censor. So at this point, so and this was uh, so now I understand very well the convenience of symbolic notation in mathematics because I had to do without. So for example, when I had to write the Brownian bridge, I had to write so consider the Brownian motion. So in words, I'm quoting my letter quite literally. Consider the Brownian motion, where of the time is a fraction, where in the numerator I have one minus and so on and so on. So this is a literal quote from my letter. So this is why, in fact, just yesterday I received a letter from Azat Miftahov about mathematics. We do hope that this will lead to something, but uh, so please uh, keep your eye on the archive. Uh, it is yet too early for me to uh, report on it right now. Okay, so uh, uh, now we resume. So uh, the uniqueness, uh, the uniqueness property, the uniqueness property is a completely general property for determinantal point processes. It's a completely general property for determinantal point processes. At the, let us now go back to the sign process where the uniqueness itself was established by Gosh, as I mentioned. So for the sign process, we can consider the classical Kotelnikov theorem of 1933. Kotelnikov theorem. <clears throat> Which says that a Pele Wiener function a Pele Wiener function can be represented as a series of shifts of the cardinal sign. So in fact, Z is a uniqueness set for the Pele Wiener space, and the function admi admits this representation in terms of. F of f of t. Let me write t actually. T minus k. T minus k. F of t. So the series converge in every conceivable sense. Uh, it and in fact it's an orthogonal representation of the square integrable function. And under additional smoothness assumptions on this uh, function, it also converges. It also converges. Pointwise, pointwise, and in uh, smooth categories, if f is itself assumed to be sufficiently smooth, as one can see from the formula itself, and it also is an orthogonal representation. It also is an orthogonal representation. So we can't hope for anything like this. We can't hope for anything like this in the setting of the sign process. So we cannot hope. So there exists a a uh, notion studied in depth uh, by Christian Seip, uh, whom Professor Vazovska mentioned also, uh, uh, just a uh, notion of sampling sets, of sampling sets uh, <clears throat> uh, where these are sets. Let us, let us for the time being stick to the Pele Wiener space. 
So these are sets such that the restriction of the function on the set, so this becomes a function from small L2, the restriction of the function on the set, the L2 norm is comparable to the L2 norm of the initial Pelevinar function. So, but uh, realizations of the same process can never possibly be sampling because in fact, they are not separated. So let us recall that the, mm, that the uh, uh, realization, <clears throat> the trajectory of the sign process emerged from the eigenvalues of a random unitary matrix. But of course, th it, there exists a positive probability that there are some eigenvalues very close to each other. And of course, any almost every realization of the sign process is in fact not a separated set. The distance between uh, particles can be arbitrarily small. It's not bounded away from zero. So also it's not bounded away from infinity, the distance between consecutive particles. Uh, so there also exist arbitrarily large gaps in the realization of the same process, but this is not very important for us. So uh, just we have this, uh, having such a representation is completely impossible. Having such a representation is completely impossible. Uh, just it is not possible to expect uh, a an orthogonal series. It's not possible to expect. So here, it is indeed an isomorphism. The Katelnikov theorem uh, provides an isomorphism, a Hilbert space isomorphism between isomet isometrical isomorphism between Pelevinar space and small L two. Such a thing is impossible in our setting. There is also another point which one has to appreciate. So as I mentioned, our general theorem also applies to the Bergman point process. At the same time. It one easily imagines that in the Bergman space, in the Bergman space, multiplying the function by Blaschke product or dividing function by Blaschke product doesn't have an impact on the function being or not a Bergman function. So while the set is a uniqueness set, while the realization of, of a set is a uniqueness set, it is always possible to remove. So if one removes 55 particles, it's still a uniqueness. Set. In fact, it's always possible to remove infinitely many particles, maybe, uh, maybe uh, sufficiently sparse so that it still remains being a uniqueness set. So it is, a, it is not possible. So here again, here the set Z is a uniqueness set for the Pelevinar space, but it is also a minimal set with this property. It's a minimal set with this property. It's a minimal set with this property. And such a thing is simply not possible, simply not possible for the, <clears throat> for the Bergman space. So it is not always, so one says that a uniqueness set, so a set, a set is a uniqueness set for a function space. If, if a function from the space restricted to the set is zero exclusively when it is the zero function. So for example, uh, realization of a determinant point process is uniqueness set for the underlying function space. So for sign process by theorem of Gauche, uh, for, Bergman, uh, for Bergman process by our result. At the same time, at the same time, uh, it is not possible, it is not possible uh, in the Bergman space for uniqueness set to be a minimal set. A minimal set is a set which is a uniqueness set and it is the smallest set having such property. It is uniqueness set and it is the smallest set having such property. So it is such situation is not possible for Bergman space. It is however possible for the sign process. And this is the main result with which I started the talk. So for the sign process, the uh, trajectory, the realization of the sign process is the uniqueness set. If one particle is removed, it is a uniqueness and minimal set. So if two particles removed, there is an explicit function, explicit Pelevinar non-zero Pelevinar function. So let me also very briefly comment on the problem of interpolation. So we do have in joint work with Borichev and Klimenko, we do have uh, a partial result in the direction of the uh, Kotelnikov theorem. So we do have so if F decays sufficiently polynomially fast, decays sufficiently polynomially fast, 
f and pale in inner space, uh, decays sufficiently polynomially fast at infinity, at infinity. Then, in fact, the Lagrange interpolation formula interpolates f. Lagrange interpolation recovers f. Interpolation recovers f. Recovers f. So uh, just uh, uh, the how do I say uh, the um, there is a gap because uh, because we don't know what happens if the function does not decay sufficiently fast. And from the technical standpoint, the key difficulty the key difficulty is that in the Lagrange interpolation formula there are derivatives. And it's precisely the derivatives estimating the derivative from below, which is the key difficulty in the paper. Okay, so let me now uh, very briefly mention that in the context of the Bergman space, in the context of the Bergman space, there is joint work with Xu, where in fact we recover joint work with Xu, where we recover uh, recover the a Bergman function. We recover a Bergman function from its restriction on the zero set of the Gaussian analytic function. So on realization of the uh, determinantal point process with the uh, Bergman kernel, we recover using the Patterson Sullivan construction. So using the Patterson Sullivan construction again here. Uh, so we let D be the Poincare, Poincare metric. So Metric. It is here again that the Lobachevskian geometry plays the key role. So we consider a x distance between x and z naught. We consider f of x. We divide, so this is summation over all x in the configuration, but in fact, summation has to be taken over annuli, over annuli. So then we can we normalize, obviously. We take limit as s goes to one, and we recover f of z naught. Also, this recovery can be made uniform in sufficiently small subspace of the Bergman space, in subspace such that the reproducing kernel has at most logarithmically growing coefficients. So this is reconstruction for the. This is reconstruction for the. Bergman space. Okay, in the remaining time, uh, I will want to say a few words about the argument, and I want to introduce reintroduce the main character, which is in fact the analog of the characteristic polynomial of the characteristic polynomial of my random matrix. Except I don't have a random matrix anymore. I have an infinite configuration. And I will now consider the analog of its characteristic polynomial. We go back to the sign process. And in fact, we will now remain exclusively with the sign process until the end of the talk. And I will also explain why. So, uh, okay. So to a realization of the sign process, one assigns the following entire function. As I wrote, so the product is understood in principal value, that is to say, over symmetric growing intervals, one minus t over x. So this is similar to the Euler product formula for the sine function, but we will see that the function will also be different. So, and in fact, the result that I have formulated the main result of the talk is that in fact for any p in x gx over t minus p does not belong to the Paley-Wiener space whereas uh, gx over t minus p t minus q so for any pq p not equal to q T minus P, T minus Q does belong to the Paley Wiener space. So I should say that, uh, that the division, 
that the division, the paley wiener space has the division property, has the division property. If, a, uh, just like polynomials, so if one divides a polynomial by, if a polynomial has a root at some point, and one divides by the root, uh, by t minus the root, then one still gets a polynomial. The same is true for paley wiener functions. And in fact, uh, this is characterization of projection kernel in joint work with uh, Roman Romanov. This is characterization of projective kernels having so-called integrable form. So having form of this type, so like uh, the kernels in the branch theory, except uh, this class of examples is somewhat more general. The paley wiener space is a branch space, but the class of integrable kernels includes also examples which are not branch. So uh, the, it's in fact a characterization, as we proved with Romanov, the fact that, the, that there is a division property, please observe the division property as I formulated is somewhat weaker than the de branch axiom, but in fact, also the class one gets is larger. It's a characterization. And also in joint work in progress with Pierre Lazag, we are able to uh, characterize uh, this property in terms of uh, Giambelli, uh, Giambelli compatibility, uh, Giambelli compatibility of uh, Baradin, Strachov, and Alshansky. So, uh, in fact, uh, Giambelli compatibility holds for an analog of Giambelli compatibility holds for processes of this form. Okay, so uh, let me now say that the key point in the analysis of in the analysis of this function, so in the proof of these two statements. So as I have explained, I don't need to prove that it is not in Pelevina, I only need to prove that it is not in L2. And here I only need to prove that it is in L2 because if it is in L2, it is automatically in the Pelevina space because of divisibility. Okay, and so how do I prove that it is not in L2? So, and in fact, here I am able to take advantage of the beautiful work related to the fyodorov hyari keating conjecture. fyodorov hyari keating conjecture. Uh, so in fact, uh, I am able to apply in this formalism. So this function can be seen, this function can be seen as the analog, as the counterpart in my setting of the characteristic polynomial of the random matrix. And in fact, I am able to apply in this setting the analysis of Argan, uh, Bellos, and Bourgade. So for the characteristic polynomial of a random matrix, who in turn uh, rely on the analysis of Nicola Kistler of uh, random uh, hierarchy of Derrida hierarchical models. So how does this, how does this uh, function, this random entire function look like? In fact, uh, in fact, uh, Kistler provides, and uh, Argan Belles Bourgade used this analysis for, uh, for <clears throat> the uh, random, uh, for the, excuse me, for the characteristic polynomial of a random matrix, and it, I, I apply it in this setting. Uh, that one can use, a very simple and clear analogy, which can be made quite precise. Namely, let us consider a binary tree. Let us consider a binary tree. Let us consider a binary tree. So, and in each vertex of the binary tree, so it's just a, let us consider just a finite binary tree. In each vertex of the finite binary tree, we place a standard Gaussian random variable. In each vertex of the, in each vertex of the finite binary, we place a standard Gaussian random variable following Kistler. So now we consider sums along paths. We consider sums along paths. And let us say we're interested in the maximal. Let's say we're interested in the maximal of these quantities. So a very naive bound, very naive bound gives the answer. So uh, if, so uh, square root two, square root two n, so the probability that the maximum is bigger where n is the depth of the tree. The probability that the maximum is bigger than that is exponentially small. So, uh, 
uh, locked, excuse me, locked. Yes, so just the uh, question is how to get an inverse bound. Question is how to get an inverse bound. So uh, the inverse bound, <clears throat> The inverse bound would be immediate from the Borel Cantelli lemma if, in fact, these were just independent random variables, but they are not. But they are not. So, uh, how does one obtain the inverse bound? And in fact, precisely, Kistler provides a completely elementary formalism. Uh, so, obviously, uh, the sums into paths are not independent because the paths have a common, a common interval. A common interval. Uh, paths have a common interval. At the same time, the common interval is very small. So clearly, paths diverge very quickly. And starting from that point, they're independent. So, and precisely, Kistler develops an analysis uh, which uh, takes care of this non-independence and allows one to use one uses not the borel cantelli lemma, but in fact the Paley the Paley Zygmunt inequality. Use the Paley Zygmunt inequality. So, in fact, it turns out that this very simple picture is exactly what happens for the characteristic polynomial or for this function, for this jx, for this jx. So just in fact, what are the independent segments? One needs to consider, well, here we have a multiplicative functional. One needs to consider the additive functional. So one needs to consider the additive functional. It is also convenient to normalize it. It is also convenient to normalize it to put i epsilon here. Consider this additive functional. It satisfies the central limit theorem. In fact, uh, it is a corollary of the second theorem of Segur. But what is important for me is the independence of this quantity for different values of t. And in fact, there is no independence. And in this, I follow uh, the analysis of Argan, Bellis, and Bourgade. But there is a hierarchical independence a hierarchical independence and the hierarchical independence namely so as opposed to argan bellus borgad the frequencies that are important for me are the low frequencies so the low frequencies the lower the frequency the longer it takes for them to become independent the lower the frequency the greater so if the frequency is not very low then for not sufficiently different values of t they are already independent if the frequency is low enough, then one needs to take a sufficiently big difference in t's for those frequencies to become independent. And this is what allows the analysis to go through. And then again, so I'm proving that this quantity is not, so let me argue in a very naive way. I'm proving that this quantity is not square integrable. In fact, I know that its values at any t, well, with some normalization, but it doesn't change things very much, is exponential of a Gaussian exponential of a Gaussian random variable. I can estimate the tails. I can estimate the big tails. So again, uh, what matters for me is the big tail. So uh, the Gaussian random variable lives around its standard deviation, the square root of its variance. What matters for me is in this analysis, uh, as it matters, for example, in uh, the study of Gaussian multiplicative chaos, is when the random variable is of the order of the size of its variance, which is here logarithm of t. So these events are, these are, let us say, large deviations. These events are not very probable. But the series of these events does diverge. So I would like to use the inverse borel cantelli lemma, except I can't because these events are not independent. So precisely, I need to use this hierarchical independence of uh, Kistler and Argan Bellis Bourgad in order to say that not only, not only for, for some t, uh, the random variable becomes big, but also this event occurs infinitely many times. And so the function is not square integrable. The function is not square integrable. Okay, so in the five minutes that remain to me, uh, let me just very briefly say, uh, make two very brief remarks that uh, the possibility to apply this analysis uh, uh, relies on the need to take the scaling limit of the Segur theorem of the second Segur theorem, scaling limit of the second Segur theorem. Except, so I need a scaling limit of the second Segur theorem. So 
the second Seeger theorem gives an asymptotic formula of this of strong Seeger. Uh, the strong Seeger theorem gives an asymptotic formula uh, for a topless determinant, that is to say, multiplicative functional of unitary matrix. And I need a scaling limit. I need a scaling limit. So I need a multiplicative functional of the sign process. And in fact, it's not possible to take literally scaling limit in strong Seeger. So I need to take scaling limit in strong, of strong Seeger in the form of Baradina Kunkov Geronimo case. So uh, this is possible. Uh, so this is possible. This statement admits a transition to the scaling limit. And this is exactly uh, what I do. Uh, so, and now uh, the second and main point is that what underlies this analysis, what is the main technical difficulty of this analysis, that at some point uh, I need an estimate on high frequencies of this additive statistics. This is, by the way, a difficulty which also Johansson, uh, Johansson uh, has in his uh, classical work on the convergence to normal distributions for additive statistics of classical groups. And Johansson has exactly this difficulty. He needs to estimate high frequencies of the, well, what for him is characteristic polynomial, what for me is this. So, and I'm able to follow Johansson analysis. What does Johansson do? Johansson does a change of variable. It is very difficult to estimate a rapidly oscillating integral. It is somewhat easier to estimate an exponentially decaying integral. So Johansson makes a change of variable, which makes a function lying on the unit circle. He uh, deforms the contour and, and uh, uh, the function becomes, uh, the function becomes <coughs> uh, a uh, exponentially decaying function. And then he's able to apply Seagull's theorem to exponentially decaying function and just even one applies the weak Seagull theorem, the first Seagull theorem, the one that Seagull proved when he was 19 years old in the trenches of the First World War. So one applies that and one gets, one gets the uh, decay of, uh, decay, desired decay of Fourier coefficients. So in this setup, precisely uh, uh, the main step uh, the main step is precisely uh, in doing, in making this change of variable, is precisely that the sign process, uh, the sign process is quasi invariant. So in order to do a change of variable, one needs to make sure that the Jacobian at least exists. So precisely the key technical step is that the sign process is quasi invariant. So under diffeomorphisms, so there are two, uh, first of all, under diffuse with compact support, with compact support, but in fact more, but in fact under diffuse x goes to x plus phi of x, where phi has finite one half Sobolev norm seminorm and finite first Sobolev seminorm. These conditions, since these are seminorms and not norms, these conditions do not apply one another. Oh. So since uh, the sign process is quasi-invariant uh, with Radon-Nikodym derivatives that can be written down explicitly, under these diffeomorphisms, it is possible to uh, use the change of variable method of Johansson. Uh, and then it is possible to estimate the Fourier transform of this analog of the characteristic polynomial. And then using the scaling limit of the borodino kunikov geronimo case formula, it is possible to reduce to the scheme of Kistler and Argan Belus Bourgade, and to prove that uh, the sign process without one particle, uh, the realization of sign process without one particle is a uniqueness set for the Pelevin inner space and with two particles is not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for this very interesting lecture. So uh, many of us want again to ask questions or maybe make comments, but uh, due to lack of time- But people can write, people can write to me. People can yes, write to me, I will answer all the questions. And we will- Please yeah, write. We will, we will forward the, the questions. So I should say that we are delighted to know that uh, Azad continues to do mathematics in prison despite the difficult situation. 
Okay, now I see that uh, the iPad of Peter is connected. So could you, uh, Sasha, just disconnect the, uh, sh stop sharing the video? Okay, very good. Okay, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, the last speaker, Peter Scholz from University of Bonn, who will speak on condensed mathematics. Please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to speak at this occasion. So yes, let me show my screen. Right, can you see? Um, yes. yes. Great, so I want to talk about uh, condensed mathematics. Um, so this is some kind of long-term, probably joint project uh, with Dustin Clausen. Um, right, so, so basically the claim that we want to make um, is that, uh, so there is this, I mean, this very old, maybe 100 years old now definition of topological spaces um, that's important in all of mathematics and that everybody knows. But we actually claim that it's the wrong definition. We should, should largely forget about this notion. And instead work with a very similar but slightly different notion of what the term condensed sets. And that doing so actually removes many of the foundational problems that you have when you work with, with topological spaces. Um, and so I, in this talk, I want to say what these condensed sets are, uh, which problems they're meant to address and uh, say a little bit about what kind of possible applications maybe um, this kind of change in foundations could have. Um, so, uh, some things we've already worked out, some things we're just hoping for, um, but it's like really, uh, I don't know, let me just try to talk about this. Um, and so it's also some kind of fighting for freedom uh, that's going on here mathematically. So um, uh, condensed sets, they are in some sense a much more free category. Um, so one puts fewer constraints on the objects and uh, has much more kind of free constructions in them, uh, contrary to topological spaces. Uh, so topological spaces, they are basically like, <clears throat> they're characterized by measurements that you do on the topological spaces. Um, like if you define open subsets and I don't know, in a Banach space or something like this, then you're basically measuring whether elements are small. So there's like a norm function that goes from the Banach space to the real numbers and something which is like a measurement that you do uh, on, on the span of space. And the topology is defined in terms of this norm. So it's different in terms of always measuring something that about the space. So you're constantly somehow observing uh, all, the, all your objects, whereas in the condensed world, you're somehow building them up from within. So it's like, I don't know. Uh, maybe I shouldn't push this analogy too far, but uh, yeah. So, right. So, so what are some of the problems uh, that you might run into? Um, um, when you use topological spaces? So here, here are some of them. Um, the one thing you might do is you might, you might have some space X, which is a nice space and G is some nice group action. For example, you might think about the real numbers and the translation by the rational numbers. Um, but then it can very often happen that the quotient space X by this group action is very pathological. So for example, in this case it might be indiscrete. So as a topological space, I'm a, it doesn't have any real structure anymore. And the problem is that you, you can't distinguish any two points in armor Q by a measurement, right? So there are no continuous functions that distinguish points in there anymore. So you can't do measurements, but in the condensed world, some of will be freely built up and it will still be an interesting object to take the quotient of the wheels by the rational numbers. Um, so, um, so that's, that's one problem. Uh, another problem uh, is that if you've given two topological spaces, or some maps from, from X to Y, or some continuous maps from X to Y, um, continuous maps, uh, 
which some will satisfy the obvious point is that it should satisfy. So there's like in gen category three, there's a general principle what what properties this kind of mapping space should have. And so the property it should have is that uh, for all topological spaces. Set of maps, continuous maps from Z into the space of morphisms is exactly the same thing as uh, the maps from the product Z times X into Y, some parameterized families of maps from X to Y. Here's a point, so it just means that the points of from X to Y should just be the continuous maps from X to Y. But uh, more generally, you would like to know that yeah, some of this thing parameterizes families of maps. And in general, there just is no such thing. And so this is related to the problem that, I mean, usually there's been a lot of discussion about compact open topologies and whatnot. Um, but it also relates to the fact that the functional analysis, there's someone not, a canonical topology you can put on a dual space. There's always lots of discussions about different kind of topologies you can put on a dual space. Um, it's because there's someone, nothing completely got given to you. Uh, that you can do it, so. So the thing you might probably want to take usually is something called the compact open topology, which often has kind of nice properties and sometimes satisfies some approximations to, to this statement. Um, and also some uh, the occurrence of lots of topologies on dual spaces. Uh, <clears throat> So here's yet another problem you, you, you run into. So some category, so these are all versions of some are saying that topological space are, are not a nice category. Um, so another way in which topological spaces fail to be a nice category is that um, when you somehow also do algebra, so you combine topology with algebra, so to like topological be a group, so topological groups to the next. Uh, then some of all the nice categories that the pure algebra has, like you be in groups, they form what's called in the being category. Um, do you lose all these nice categorical properties? So, um, the topological being groups. Can be in category. Um, and let me just uh, give one very concrete example. Uh, it's a very abstract statement after all, but it's a very concrete phenomenon. Um, so for example, if you just take, I mean, even more drastically than letting the rational numbers from as a discrete group act on the real numbers, you can, the, like the real numbers as a discrete group, they also act on the real numbers in their natural topology. Um, and some of this is encoded somehow in having this natural map from R with its discrete topology to R with its natural topology. So that's, that's certainly a continuous map of topological being groups. But there are certainly no elements in the kernel, no elements map to zero that are not already in groups. So the kernel map is zero. And also, the map is subjective, so also they, they can't somehow be any program. So the kernel is also zero. Both surjective and injective somehow this map, but it's not a, it's not a nice morphism. And I it's probably not so clear how you could ever correct correct this problem. That it, I mean, you will always have continuous maps that are not homeomorphisms, just by just putting the discrete topology instead on your set. And so um, it's probably, probably not clear how you might want to correct that. But is this possible? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean. But still, I mean, doing homological algebra with topological things is something that's done a whole lot. I mean, in Hodge theory, in Piedicott theory, and all sorts of areas, it's, there's continuous group homology. There's lots and lots and lots of situations where you do want to mix homological algebra, so it's not derived functors, all this uh, being category stuff with topological being groups. And I mean, you can basically do it in practice, but there are just all sorts of foundational issues that you run into. 
So for example, if you have a complex, Uh, topologically, topological being groups. Um, then I mean it's it's homology, so this is a kernel uh, of one differential divided by the image of the previous differential. Um, this may just be again pretty pathological. And basically, it is always pathological unless the image is closed. Because if the image is not closed, then somehow there is, you see, somehow, for example, the image is dense in the kernel. And then this, this, this portion is again some indiscreted being grouped. And so it just doesn't make much sense if it's topological. <coughs> and it goes on and on. And in practice, you can usually get your way through, but not so nice. Um, yeah, so the claim is that by replacing topological spaces uh, by condensed sets. Um, well, on the one hand, all your problems disappear. Certainly all the ones I've just mentioned. Um, but in practice, you don't actually feel the difference. So the, the categories are so close that in all the examples you actually care about of like topological space and so on, or yeah, all the classes by ways of nice topological space, they are just also, they are nice condensed sets and you don't feel any difference. It's just that in condensed sets, you, there are more things you can do. So you get some extra objects that feel weird from the topological space point of view, but are completely well behaved in some sense from it in this world of condensed sets. Um, yeah, so, so in practice, um, the change, Really <clears throat> All the things you could previously do, you can still do. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, so I should explain what condensed sets are. Um, right, so, uh, so that's it. Yeah, so there's some build from basic building blocks. And what are, what are the building blocks? So the building blocks are the point. So they have some sense freely built from uh, building blocks. Um, uh, so what are the building blocks? So there, there's several different ways of describing some of the category of building blocks. Um, let me uh, mention several of them. So maybe <clears throat> the most useful one is, to, um, is the category of stone spaces. So these are just, uh, they're totally disconnected. For example, a counter set. I mean, as you may know, I'm a very chaotic person, and so that's why uh, I got into this business in the first place about some of building up my all my things from uh, totally disconnected things like the chaotic numbers. Um, so yeah, so the real numbers they are very much not totally disconnected, but uh, we'll come to them in a second. Um, yeah, so there is this uh, classical stone duality, which says that um, these uh, totally disconnected compact house of spaces are completely equivalent to Boolean algebras. So here, 
totally disconnected function. You can look at uh, the compact and open, uh, the closed and open and closed subsets. This is a form of form of Boolean algebra. And conversely, if you have a Boolean algebra, you can somewhat take its spectrum, and you will get such a uh, totally disconnected open and closed subsets. And a different way yet to think about these totally disconnected compact class of spaces is that uh, there's some inverse limit of finite sets. And these are you know, the true finite sets. So you can start with finite sets and then freely adjoin some of these uh, inverse limits of them. And so I will generally denote such objects in here by S and uh, write them as an inverse limit of finite sets, SI. So, I mean, if you have some, for example, the counter set, so, so you take uh, um, it's both in this inductive procedure where you somehow take the interval and chop it into pieces, into small and smaller pieces. Um, and somehow in the end, you just get some kind of uh, dust cloud uh, that's left when you do take all these intersections. And uh, if you do the summer uh, as an inverse limit of finite sets, then you just contract um, this metasomorphic key to the inverse limit where you somehow replace at each step each of these intervals by just a point. And then you somehow split up each of these points into two points at each step. And then uh, you get an inverse limit of finite sets. And so in the end, you, you again get some kind of point cloud. Um, it's, it's an isomorphism because some of these intervals have become shorter and shorter. And so in the limit, it somehow doesn't matter that you replace each of them by a point. Um, All right. Um, so, uh, why do I want to take them as my basic building blocks? So, the fact is, uh, the basic fact that's uh, critical to the whole theory is the following slightly weird phenomenon that whenever you have any compact host of space, um, then there exists a surjection from S onto X. Where this here is totally disconnected, a totally disconnected compact of space. Um, and I mean, how does this work? So, say uh, if x is the interval, then what you do is the following. So, it, you start with the interval x, and then you just chop it off again and again and again. Uh, so, in the first step, you chop it up into two pieces. And then each of those two pieces, you again chop up into two pieces. That's your x2. And then you continue this process and chop up, chop up, chop up, again and again and again. And then what you get end up in the inverse limit, some the inverse limit of all of these. Well, that's this picture and this picture, they're exactly the same thing, except that I sum and in each of these pieces, some is more or less the same. And so there's actually also a contrast. And in fact, this is precisely uh, given by the set zero one to the n, uh, where some uh, here you have zero and one, here it's zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So some, uh, um, finding out at which point in this x infinity you are, some, uh, at each point you have to say whether you're in the first or the second interval. So you can write this down by either writing a zero or a one, and then some uh, appending. And so actually what's implicit here is it's somehow the decimal extent as a binary, I guess I'm doing here. Um, um, so this X infinity, it's just an infinite product of uh, copies of this two element set. Um, this subjects onto X, which is the interval by sending some more sequence A N uh, to the sum a n over two to the n, I guess. In, in <clears throat> um, and yeah, so some, in, in school, some of we learned to think of the real numbers, some in terms of decimal expansions. But then we somehow learn this extra fact that let's say you did it in binary, then we learn this kind of extra fact that zero. 0.01111 is the same thing as 1.0.10000. Um, so 
the real numbers are not actually decimal or binary expansions or whatever, but you somehow have to keep these extra identifications in place. And binary expansions themselves, they wouldn't actually look at like an interval at all. They would actually be totally disconnected. They would be a counter set. And you only get to the continuum once you make these identification series. So for example, this identification is precisely corresponds to doing the endpoint of this, which is somehow corresponds to 0 0.01111 to so the beginning point of that. So these have to be glued back together if you want to get the interval. Okay. So there is something very geometric happening uh, in these kind of weird equations like this. So we're really we're doing this continuum from something totally disconnected. All right. Okay, so uh, this still feels like a very weird way about, for thinking about the real numbers. So I mean, admittedly, uh, this seems like a strange perspective. Uh, to think about uh, the interval. To somewhat chop it up into this way. Okay. Can do it. Um, and so some yeah, part, part of what bugged me for a long time when I was thinking about condensed mathematics was exactly the question whether this could at all be a good good way to think about uh, these real numbers. And okay, so this uh, probably will come back to this. Okay, but finally, let me now uh, give the definition. So, what I'm going to There are sheaves on uh, this category of profinite sets, or if you want to stone spaces, um, for a specific group in topology. Uh, where it covers our finite families of junky subject types. And so in general, this formalism of, of sheaves is a way to somehow start with, with some kind of build, class of building blocks, which are the objects in your category you start with, so in this case, profinite sets. And so start from this category and freely build a large, larger category around this that's somehow glued from these basic objects that's somehow build out of these basic building blocks. So, and uh, the Scrotonic topology somehow gives you this certain kinds of gluings that would somehow how these building blocks glued and the glue to each other. So, okay. Uh, so concretely, some of uh, these are functors uh, from profinite sets. The sets. So it takes any profinite set S to some some set X of S, which are exactly the maps inside of condensed sets from S into X. <clears throat> so what you're remembering is how profinite sets map into, uh, into your condensed set. So topological space where some are more about mapping out of X, so about doing measurements on X, uh, but condensed sets are about how things map into X, okay? Uh, okay so, so this point to X needs to satisfy some properties which are easy to write down and uh, usually satisfied in anything you would write down. I don't want to spell it out here. Also, I should make a very brief remark that there are certain set theoretic subtleties involved in this definition that will completely gloss over them and they are not really substantial for anything. <clears throat> so, uh, 
Yeah. So these are um, my condensed sets. And I should give some examples. And the easy way to give examples is to first discuss the relation to topological spaces because each topological space gives you an example um, of such a condensed set. So if T is a topological space, then we can define a condensed set T underline. Which just takes any S to the continuous maps from S into T. Um, this is a condensed set. Okay, so yeah. So you just remember how profile sets map into your space, and that's that determines your it determines a condensed set. So we have a functor from topological space to condensed sets, and this functor is actually has very good uh, properties. So uh, here's a basic proposition. So on compactly generated topological spaces. The analog of an inclusion in categories, in categories here. So, and compactly generated is basically includes everything you ever cared about. Um, so, for example, it includes everything that's first countable. And this in turn includes everything that's metrizable. <clears throat> so, all these kind of topological spaces. If you somehow consider them as condensed sets instead, you lose no information at all. <clears throat> okay, and in, even more precisely, like if you look at the, the class of compact host of spaces, this can even be recovered on the nose on the other side. So you have the condensed sets uh, that are so called quasi compact and quasi separated. And where I should note that some of the compact house doors, these are topological top spaces that have two properties. On the one hand, they have a compactness property. On the other hand, they have kind of separation property that you can separate points by open subsets. And both of these words like compactness and separation, they have like general chief theoretic incarnations. And these chief theoretic notions are for some reason called quasi-compact and quasi-separated. So you're somewhat just translating the conditions you would like to put here. Into the world of like sheaves that you have separated. And then it turns out that if you have four layers on content, you can exactly recover uh, your compact cluster spaces. So, in particular, although we started with just a totally disconnected compact host of spaces, we immediately recover all of the compact host of spaces um, uh, in this procedure. So, they automatically become for free. and. Uh, Implicit here is this fact that any compact host of space admits these surjections from totally disconnected models. Um, and uh, if you just enforce uh, the separation hypotheses, then this also admits a, a classical description. Uh, so these are exactly the inductive limits where the transition maps are closed immersions uh, of compact host of spaces. So they are basically. Yeah, Increasing union of compact house of spaces. And um, this is very, very close to a category that is very much considered in topology, especially in algebraic topology. So there are so called compactly generated weak house of spaces. So this is very close to the CW complexes and stuff like that. Um, that's very often used in algebraic topology. And so these two categories they are almost equivalent. And so, yeah, so if you just ask the separation hypothesis on this side, you again can recover something classical. Um, sorry, it's classical that. But uh, some of the, what the thing that's really new about condensed sets is that you can also have these objects where you don't have any separation hypothesis, where you take a portion by a group action with dense orbits. 
And to, politically, this didn't make any sense at all, really. You get the indiscrete topology, but on the sort of condensed set, it still has a very well-defined meaning. And it's still a very reasonable object to, to consider. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, from now on, I really want to do algebra in this world. Um, so, uh, so uh, in the following, I want to really talk about analysis being groups. Uh, as I said about, uh, if you do uh, topological being groups, then you run into all sorts of foundational issues. Not really being category, and then if you take the homology of a complex, you probably get some kind of quotients by this, it's not like groups with dense orbits and so on, so and so on. But uh, if you um, just work with condensed to be in groups, so these are really just a B in group objects in this category of condensed sets. These are all the definitions. So, so I'm putting the structure on top of condensed sets is quite easy. Um, so you have this category of condensed to be in groups, call it front with up. And this is actually in a being category. Um, uh, with extremely nice properties. Uh, so in particular, filter columns I expect. So when you do when you do homological algebras, then you want to know that as many as possible functors functors are exact because yeah this means that certain computations will become much easier and so something one very often uses is some other increasing unions of stuff some filter columns that they they should behave nicely and that's true but even more um, something that's not so often true that is true in this case infinite power. that is true in usual abelian groups. But for most categories of sheaves of the being groups, for example, it fails. But here it's true, infinite products are exact. That's also very useful. Um, and uh, but it's also, yeah, so it uh, has compact projective generators. So in fact, something that's uh, implicit here, and that's also maybe a little different than one is used to. So you definitely have a get function uh, from condensed abelian groups to condensed sets, if you just take the underlying abelian group. And as I said previously, this, this condensed world is very much a free world. And uh, one technical way in which it is a free world is that you have let uh, you have some of the left adjoint to this function, which is some of the free Condensed to be in group on a condensed set. And uh, these compact projective generators, they can actually be taken to these views on S, where S is what's called an extremely disconnected uh, profile set. So an example of this would be the stone chest complexification of a discrete set. <laughs> okay, so in particular, it's a world, if you want to compute some if you do want to do a homological algebra here, you can really use projective resolutions, just like in usual, the homological algebra of R modules for some ring R. And so, yeah, so in particular, there is already get, got given to you the notion of like X groups now between condensed and groups. So, so we can do homological algebra. So somehow the formalism automatically gives to you lots of cohomology groups, lots of X groups you can compute here. Um, on the other hand, 
And we started with topological spaces. And for topological spaces, we know what kind of the correct cohomology group should be. I mean, if you have a, like a manifold and it has singular cohomology groups, and some of those are in some sense the correct cohomology groups you want to consider on a manifold. And so a priori, there might now be a discrepancy between uh, the kind of general, between like the cohomology groups you would like to have, which are like the singular cohomology groups of manifolds, and the thing that comes out of the formalism here. But fortunately, it turns out that these things exactly match up. So there's a theorem that if uh, S is say a CW complex, then um, the singular cohomology of this is canonically isomorphic to the X group in condensed being groups from the free guy on S against. Or you could also do this with, with coefficients here if you wanted. So if I take the singular cohomology with coefficients in some of being group M, then there's also the X group. <clears throat> so the right hand side is the, uh, the general kind of chief theoretic notion of how you would define cohomology of this. And it turns out that this exact thing recovers the singular cohomology result. So, I mean, singular cohomology traditionally is like a very tricky definition involving all these uh, singular code chains and so on. Um, here it just comes out of the form. <clears throat> uh, maybe a, an example I should have given but forgot. Um, so above I gave this example uh, that uh, topological being groups are not in the being category. Like you have the discrete reals mapping to the like, usual reals with their natural topology. And this doesn't have a kernel or a co-kernel. So how do you rectify this actually in the condensed world? Um, so, I mean, you can't sort of take out of this discrete topology. There's a topological group, so you can't pass to this condensed world, which I did almost by this underline. And it turns out that this way, this will inject into R with its natural topology. It takes a corresponding condensed being group. It turns out that now there's a non-trivial co-kernel. And actually, what is a core kernel? Well, for any profile set S, the values of this are somehow the, the continuous maps from S into here. So the continuous maps here are the continuous maps from S into the reals with the natural topology. And the quotient by the continuous maps from S to the reals with the discrete topology. And because of the discrete topology, these maps must be locally constant. So the quotient by the locally constant. Uh, functions on R. And so if you do this on just a point, well, then the continuous function, I mean, the point, the point is just determined by the value at this point, which so it's the real, it's the real. So, so Q of the underlying sum of B and group is just zero if you evaluate this at a point. But once you map a larger profile set into this, like a counter set or something like this, then well, the counter set is a subset of the reals, with a continuous map. But it's not, the map is not locally constant. So you, you have more interesting maps here than here. So this is really a close subset, a, a proper subset here. And so you can, yeah. in general profile set F is just something non zero. And so you have this funny quotient group here, um, which is like hard to imagine classically, but okay. So if you get used to it, it's not so strange. I mean, it's really just, I mean, this definition here is really very much remembering exactly how it's built as a quotient of some R with its natural topology remembered by these continuous functions by the local constants. Right. <clears throat> and so, uh, there are lots of questions you can ask yourself whether uh, um, all sorts of computations that you've done uh, classically uh, and like topological being groups or continuous group cohomology, but the, all the computations you've done there, whether they are still valid in this condensed being group world. Or somehow, if you want to say define continuous group cohomology groups, then you don't have to make up a definition. You don't have to by hand write down a complex of continuous code chains. But again, this formalism just tells you what the continuous group cohomology groups should be. And again, it turns out that in all examples I've ever looked at, 
this does agree with the continuous group cohomology groups that have been considered classically. <clears throat> and like maybe one concrete instance of this is that there's some kind of version of uh, Cortiagi duality. This also works in, in this setting. Uh, so if you, if A and B are locally compact, so these are some of the nicest classes of topologic being groups, of these locally compact being groups. <clears throat> then you can wonder some of what all the X groups now are between between um, between them in condensed being groups. And the X groups in condensed being groups from A or its corresponding um, condensed being group. Um, and well, it's just the continuous homomorphisms from A to B I is equal to zero. I mean, this just falls from this fully phase forms result which I said previously. <clears throat> but if you do this X1, then this is about extension as condensed being groups. And so a priori, if you want to compute some, some X1, then what you need to do is you need to resolve say this A here by, by these projective generators, which are these free condensed being groups on, on these extremely disconnected sets. So these are basically some kind of weird clouds of dust. So they're basically chopping up this A completely like you chopped up the real numbers. You chop it up to a cloud of dust and resolve some of everything in terms of these clouds of dust. Then you take an extension to B and then you somehow assemble everything back together. And then you wonder whether the object you get this way is still something reasonable. And there, a priori there's absolutely no reason that this is still a reasonable object. But by a somewhat hard computation, it turns out that it is a reasonable object. And uh, the X1 is really just the X1. So all these extensions, they are extensions. They are themselves all in public to being groups. It's the same thing as the X1 in local being groups. And there are no higher X. In particular, if you take for B as a circle group, then this exactly means that, like, you get the usual point of duality, for example, right in discrete groups and compact being groups and so on. <clears throat> so you can do all, do all these computations um, and they, they behave really nice. Uh, the only problem that you really have, I think of that. You do have just abstractly automatically have um, temper products, but it's basically impossible to compute them. Um, so yeah. And what you very, very much would like to have is a notion of a completed tensor product that somehow uh, For example, if you take, say, a power series algebra in one variable, and some tensor with a power series algebra in another variable, then you would very much like that's kind come of completed tensor product of these two things. Sorry, there shouldn't be a P here. Um, should probably be a completed power series algebra in both of these variables. But it's just not true. It's like the underlying. The being group of this tensor product is just a usual algebraic tensor product, which is just some nonsense. Um, and so finding such a notion of such a kind of, I mean, you just you don't just want a complete tensor product, but you just want the notion of complete condensed being groups. And this is something that Dustin Clausen and I struggled with quite a while until we somehow figured out what's really going on. Um, and what's going on is, Something that I find quite surprising a priori is that the good way to define this notion of completeness is not, not one notion that you define once and for all for all condensed being groups. But really, it's whenever you have like a ring R and you consider some condensed R modules, and so ring R, this might be the integers, might be the real numbers with a natural topology, whatever. Um, <clears throat> you somehow should to find a relative notion of what it means to be complete over that ring. And this can even vary 
Like you might even have the same underlying ring and then different notions of completeness um, measuring some of slightly different things. So <clears throat> uh, it's not very surprising uh, how this works, but it uh, fits really nicely into a lot of formalisms. So, um, so we abstracted this idea into a following definition. It's what we call an So this is somehow the no, the idea is that an analytic ring is well a condensed ring, so like something like the Borchig ring, together with a notion uh, of completeness for modules over this ring. So maybe the rings you really care about they may all come from topological rings. Uh <clears throat> And uh, the way this is encoded is that um, uh, it's encoded in a function that takes any any profile set S to something we call here A and then some of the completeness is the method in terms of something what we call M. And what is this M? This is a function that takes any profile at ZS to something called M of S, which is a free complete condensed A module. On S. And it's very often the way to think about this is that some kind of space of measures on S. A valued measures. <clears throat> so, uh, so because it's a free guy, some S in particular maps to it and any point of S some of maps to the Dirac measure at this point. But then there are certain, certain infinite sums of elements of S that some are, should give rise to like convergent sums of elements. So in the free complete guy, you want some are, to join certain infinite sums together. And these are some, are, yeah. together they form some kind of space of measures. And uh, so uh, they condensed. Will then be complete if for all, uh, whenever you map uh, the profile that S into M, then well, S maps Y as more Dirac measures uh, to the space of all like measures on S. And then there should be a unique extension um, to map from the like three on S, so, which should sort of send a measure here to the integral of f against this measure. <clears throat> okay, so um, we define this notion of analytic ring. It's somehow the datum of, of such a condensed ring together with a uh, notion of like these, these spaces of measures on profile sets, satisfying a certain list of properties which ensures that um, this notion of complete modules really has a lot of very, very nice properties. Um, and then the really non-trivial part is to produce interesting examples uh, of the structure. And um, there are basically two key examples uh, we have. The first thing is what we called uh, the solid being groups. So solidness is one kind of notion of completeness in this kind of abstract sense of analytic ring. 
So, so there is an analytic ring that we denote by a Z solid. It's solid, so I've written as this black square here. Um, uh, where the underlying ring is just C. And if you want to know what the free guy uh, on the proof of this is, there are two ways to think about this. Well, one way is to write your profile set S as the inverse limit of finite sets. And then this free guy will just be the inverse limit of the Z adjoint. I. So for each finite free, for each finite set, you just take the usual free module on the finite set. And then you just extend by limits to all finite sets. But a different way to think about this is that this is exactly the homomorphisms from the space of continuous functions from S into Z to Z. So this is some of the internal So as I said previously, some are incondensable, or maybe didn't say, um, in condenser being groups, such a home object automatically again is a condenser being group. So this problem that there was no natural topology in the topology case is resolved here. It has a natural condensed structure. And um, so this, I mean, this thing here, it would exactly be some of the z valued measures on S. A measure should be something that associates to each continuous function uh, a number. And then take the internal. By the way, how much time do I, when should I stop? Sorry. Maybe so, I you, uh, you still have maybe 10 minutes for. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is okay, it okay? Thanks. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, I was worried I was already over time. No, no, you started slightly after. Okay, yeah. Um, right, so uh, I mean, that's the most natural thing that you would think about as maybe the space of Z valued measures on the proof of the And so you can see two different descriptions. and. Um, yeah, so then I mean, now I told you what the, the free free guy here is in, for solid being groups. And then this here tells you what a solid being group is. It's one way whenever you map S into M, you get a unique map uh, from, from this larger guy here. And uh, then there is a theorem. And that's somehow a theorem that's true for any analytic ring, but in particular, like for the complete modules, but in particular for solid being groups, solid being groups. Uh, form in a being category. A stable under all limits. Well, limits are actually clear from the way I stated it. <laughs> but we want to have a free world, so it should also be stable under co-limits. And it is stable under all co-limits. And that's uh, not clear at all from the definition. Um, it's also stable under all extensions. Um, and again, it has compact projective generators. Which are exactly the infinite products of copies of Z. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so basically when you start with, with the integers and then perform any kind of algebraic constructions, like taking the infinite direct sum, taking infinite product of such, then modding out by something. All of these constructions you can do and they will never leave the world of solid being groups. So, I mean, uh, you have ZP, you can have, I don't know, you can have an infinite direct sum of ZPs. You can take an infinite product of QPs and mod out by an infinite direct sum of QPs, what not? All of these things are uh, solid being groups. The only way really to leave into this category is to take tensor products. And so when you take tensor products, you need to re-solidify them. But then it turns out that if you do that, and if you somehow take a power series algebra on one variable and then take the solid tensor product with a power series algebra on another variable, it turns out that this is precisely the power series algebra on both of them. And so, yeah, in practice, it's really easy to compute this uh, solidified tensor product. And <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you also 
get that solid QP vector spaces, there's a more formful subcategory of solid abelian groups. And uh, this is a very nice home for periodic functional numbers. And this has already seen some applications, for example, in periodic theory, uh, this, this category of solid QP vector spaces. So there would be ways to, because somehow you can explicitly say what the compact projective generators are, there are some kind of synthetic ways of rebuilding this category without any condensed formalism. And so there's some kind of synthetic way to building solid QP vector spaces. But even in the synthetic way, it wasn't known before. Um, also, probably would have been natural already. Uh, so or maybe another, some, so inside there, inside these solid guys, for example, have some Frechet spaces over QP. And on Frechet spaces, you already have the notion of a completed tensor product of classical one. And it turns out that this exactly agrees with a solid tensor product. So like all the classical things you've done with getting Frechet spaces, um, you can just translate them into uh, the solid world. But uh, if you ever run into such weird functions like this with a dense image, then classically you couldn't continue really. But here you can just continue, and you, and you can also take some other with such guys, and everything works well. All right. <clears throat> so this was something that we figured out quite soon. So, yeah. and all the theorems here don't work with the custom class. Um, but like the thing we were still quite unsure about is whether something similar could work over the real numbers. I mean, some of this whole formalism of condensed sets this was very much inspired by uh, periodic stuff. It's based on totally disconnected sets and it works well in periodic functions analysis, but all of this is totally disconnected. So it's maybe not so surprising that it works well there. But it was very much an open question whether the similar ideas could work over the real numbers. And uh, we struggled really a lot in establishing something over the real numbers, but eventually we succeeded in building something that we termed solution over the real numbers. <laughs> and this is some kind of version of, of the notion of classical notion of, of complete locally convex vector spaces. But we need to get rid of, of convexity. And actually, the reason that classically you always only ever consider convex vector spaces is exactly that you think it in terms of measurements. So these locally convex vector spaces, they can, they can always be defined by a family of semi-norms, so by some maps to the real numbers. So, and the real numbers, they are, of course, they have this kind of convexity property. Um, but and so everything is where, some, uh, where the topology is some, uh, remembered by maps to the real numbers that must be locally convex. But you somehow insist on being able to some, uh, distinguish things by measurements. Uh, but that's not what we're doing here. And so it actually turns out that we really need to leave the convex, locally convex world uh, for this formalism. Uh, so in fact, there's a classical example of Riebe. Um, that locally convex vector spaces are not stable under extensions. And we want our categories to be stable under extensions. So we are forced to leave the locally convex world, uh, which is a pain because a lot of techniques break down when you lose convexity. Um, so this, by the way, related to the entropy function. So Shannon entropy. So I was quite surprised when I ran into entropy. I didn't expect to do this. Um, uh, right. And so what we do is we somehow fix the number. Um, and well, P usually for me is a prime number, but it's also the standard letter you use to denote P convex things. So uh, now P is a number between zero and one. Um, and this gives rise to what we call P liquid. Other cases where the relevant space of measures on S is defined as follows. Um, so let's R 
So there, there's an analytic ring R and the less than P measures. Uh, so these are the union of all P prime less than P, strictly less than P. Uh, also P prime measures. And the P prime measures in turn are this my F S S. Sorry. I'll be right in two steps. That's the union of these P prime measures on S. And what is this uh, P prime measures on S? One way to write is that the union of all constants bigger than zero, same as limit over all I, of the free R vector space on S I, where the LP prime norm is less or equal to zero. <clears throat> okay. Um, some definition we came up with here. And so, uh, yeah. yeah, so these, mm, these spaces of measures somehow encoded your, your, your vector space are somehow P prime convex for all P prime less than P. And then we had to prove some really hard theorems to show that this really defines an analytic ring. So that some of the analog of say this theorem about solid being groups is true for these P liquid real vector spaces. And uh, uh, yeah, so surprise. The proof that this works, so that this defines an analytic ring, uh, uses arithmetic in a sense. So it uses a certain ring of, of convergent Laurent series over the integers. Which subjects onto the reals. And say so if it's say map t to the tens, that's somehow about taking some a n times t to the n and mapping it to some a n times 10 to the minus n. Um, so it's about writing again, as in the beginning, you're writing real numbers in terms of decimal expansions. And this really seems critical for the proof uh, of some idea. Thinking about reals in terms of decimal expansions. And some are really introducing some arithmetic base ring into the picture. I find this really surprising that you somehow, in order to set up real functional analysis, you need to do arithmetic in this well. Okay, and so I'm running out of time now. So let me just end. By, I, mentioned, I mentioned analytic geometry in the abstract. So let me just very briefly say one word about it. Um, so like an algebraic geometry, uh, where you start from rings and build the spectrum of these rings and then glue these spectra to, uh, to, 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 to do the schemes. Um, you can build some notion of analytic spaces that are glued from what we term the analytic spectrum, some such pair consisting of such an such analytic ring. Uh, and this is an extremely general notion of analytic space that simultaneously generalizes basically all the notions that, that you can think of. So, so on the one hand, it generalizes like complex analytic spaces. But also it generalizes various notions of real manifolds that you can think about, smooth manifolds, uh, topological manifolds, whatnot. Um, but you also can, I mean, schemes map there, usual schemes, also, but also more analytic notions in this world, formal schemes or rigid analytic varieties. Or in fact, uh, completely general analytic spaces. And even some foundational issues about analytic spaces are resolved in this formalism. About non chiefiness And <clears throat> you get this really nice category of analytic spaces. You can define some very general notion of cross equivalent sheaves on these analytic spaces, which is something you didn't actually have previously in analytic geometry. And yeah, it's some of a world where analytic, I mean, uh, Archimedean stuff like real numbers and complex numbers and the periodic numbers, non Archimedean stuff, they can for, live in one world together. Um, yeah, so it's some kind of. Very nice no, that is okay. okay, thanks a lot, Peter, for this great lecture, which uh, opens a new perspectives in mathematics.
So it's almost time to close this webinar and the closing remarks will be given by my colleague Ilya Kapovic from Hunter College of CUNY on behalf of the Azat Miftakov Committee. Yes, thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, so um, uh, it's an honor to give uh, this closing remarks on, on behalf of the Azad Miftahov Committee. So first, I'd like to uh, thank uh, all the speakers. Uh, so we've heard a great deal of uh, very interesting mathematics today. Uh, and uh, so I personally learned something. So I hope uh, the rest of you did too. Uh, um, uh, I'd also like to uh, 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 thank the contributors uh, who uh, provided uh, uh, contributions for the video that we saw, uh, so uh, provided messages of support for that. Uh, uh, and I'd like to thank all the participants who participated both via Zoom and uh, who watched uh, the, uh, the conference via live streaming on YouTube. Uh, I'd also, I also want to acknowledge and thank the, uh, the various scientific societies, uh, mathematical societies and other organizations who uh, helped publicize this event uh, 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 on the websites and in other ways. So that was very helpful. Uh, so there are many people who uh, made this event possible, who worked very hard uh, to uh, organize it. Uh, so among uh, the members of our committee, I do want to mention uh, uh, Professor Chandler Davis, uh, who is himself a former uh, political prisoner. Uh, so he was in a very early uh, version of this event, uh, supposed to be one of the speakers. Unfortunately, he had a serious uh, health event, so he's now recovering. So our best wishes go to him. He did provide a message uh, a written message that you saw in that video. Uh, so this event uh, has uh, been organized by uh, the mathematical community outside of Russia. Uh, but of course, uh, we do. Uh, uh, we should remember uh, uh, Azad supporters, both mathematicians and non-mathematicians, uh, 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 who, uh, who are now inside of Russia. So we do remember them. Uh, uh, so there are many of Azad supporters uh, who are inside Russia, and they're the ones who are facing real danger. So our thoughts go, go to them as well. And we should not lose sight of why we're here today in the first place, which is because of Azad, because of the fact that he has been unjustly prosecuted and uh, imprisoned, uh, and now uh, he is facing a transfer, uh, imi probably imminent transfer to a prison colony uh, after the uh, June 9, June 9 uh, uh, appeals court hearing that uh, was mentioned here earlier. Uh, so. Uh, uh, we live in a world where there is a lot of noise, a lot of shouting, and it's fairly hard to recognize uh, which uh, uh, to tell apart uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 real outrages from imagined ones, but I think we should still try. It's important to make an attempt because uh, as mathematicians and as scientists and scholars, we are citizens of the world, we are citizens of the global uh, uh, mathematical community and not just of the countries uh, whose passports uh, we hold. And uh, I think we have an obligation to uh, speak up uh, for our colleagues uh, who are oppressed and unjustly prosecuted when that happens. Uh, and we have an obligation to try to help them. And for me, at least personally, uh, the fight for justice always begins and ends with trying to help a specific person. Uh, uh, and not thousands of millions of people, but one person uh, whose uh, human rights and freedoms are being abused. Uh, and uh, um, a person like our colleague uh, uh, Azad Miftahov, uh, who is currently in a Russian prison and faces uh, probably darker day heads uh, of uh, being transferred to the, to the prison colony. So, uh, um, I hope that today's event has been uh, 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 has been a success, at least uh, in, in, in a certain sense that it went well. And usually after a successful mathematical conference, there is a discussion about organizing another one next year and maybe even making it an annual event. In this case, I hope you will not have to do that. I hope it will not become necessary because I certainly hope that a year from now, Azad will be free. But uh, if that will uh, turns out not to be the case, uh, uh, so uh, if it turns out that uh, 
we do need to have uh, another one of these events a year from now, we will do that. So uh, the main message that I want to deliver from the uh, 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 Azad Miftahov committee is that uh, we will not give up the fight, we will persevere, we will continue to press for Azad's release uh, and uh, we will uh, uh, we'll do that until he is freed and I hope that we'll, we can count uh, on your support as well. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank you again and bring today's Azad Miftahov day to a close. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ilya. Thanks a lot for these very strong words. So uh, what can I say? Just that we will not let go until Azad is free. Thanks a lot and uh, take care. Goodbye.